Good morning. The Division I National Semifinal Game 1 press conference featuring the Virginia Tech Hokies will begin in approximately nine minutes. In addition to Coach Brooks, we'll be joined on the dais with student athletes Elizabeth Keatley, Taylor Soul, and Georgia Amore. Again, that press conference will begin in approximately eight minutes. The Division I National Semifinal Game 1 press conference featuring the Virginia Tech Hokies scheduled to begin in five minutes.
The Division I National Semifinal Game 1 press conference featuring the Virginia Tech Hokies will begin momentarily. We'll hear an opening statement from Coach Brooks and we'll follow with questions to the student athletes Elizabeth Keatley, Taylor Soule, and Georgia Amore. The student athletes will then be dismissed and we will open with questions from Coach Brooks. Please make sure your cell phones are on silent. We will get started momentarily. When called upon, please make sure to state your name and affiliation. There are wireless microphones on each side of the room. Please wait for the microphone to reach you before stating your question. For those joining remotely, please use the raise hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. When you are called on for your question, please unmute your line and state your name and affiliation. Again, we'll begin momentarily.
Good morning and welcome to the Division I National Semifinal Game 1 Press Conference Virgi featuring the Virginia Tech Hokies. Again, we'll hear an opening statement from Coach Brooks and follow with questions from the student athletes. We'll then dismiss the student athletes and we'll continue with opening up questions for Coach Brooks. As a, another reminder, please make sure your cell phones are on silent. When called upon, please state your name and affiliation. There are wireless microphones on each side of the room. Please wait for the microphone to reach you before stating your question. We will have those joining us remotely, and if so, please raise your hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. When you are called on for your question, please unmute your line and state your name and affiliation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Coach, great. if we could start and have you do an opening statement, please. It's great to be here, obviously, uh, not just because I'm a Cowboy fan, but uh, I'm a big fan of, of these kids and uh, watching them all year long and everything that they've gone through, uh, their, their ability to stick together, their resiliency, uh, and then their just ability to sacrifice uh, has really gotten us to this point. Um, and I'm very proud of their accomplishments and what they've done. So there's been many that have been individual, uh, but the biggest ones are the team goals that we've accomplished, and I'm very, very proud of them. Um, and I'm excited for this weekend because uh, we feel like we, if we are the best version of ourselves, then we give ourselves a shot. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity. At this time, we'll open up questions for the student athletes. Again, as a reminder, please make sure to raise your hand and allow the microphone holders to reach you. And if you are joining us virtually, please raise your hand as well so that I can acknowledge it through our Zoom. Uh, Mark Berman, The Roanoke Times. Uh, for uh, Taylor and Liz, um, uh, I'm sure you grew up watching the, the Final Four on TV. Uh, given that, what is it like to actually now have arrived here? Um, it's pretty surreal uh, to be here, but I think Coach says it. It's one thing to be here, and it's another thing to be in the tournament, and so it's a blessing. Um, it's still a little bit of a fever dream, um, and just trying to take it all in. Um, but it's definitely really fun, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it, it's really cool because I think, you know, growing up or even, like, the last few years in college, like, we would have our season, and then it would come to an end too soon, and then I would enjoy watching the rest of the games. But now, you know, we're in those games, and I couldn't be more happy about that. Um, and I'm just so excited that I get to play with these guys for a little bit longer. Uh, Michael Cobble, WBRZ TV in Baton Rouge. This is for Elizabeth. Just the matchup, obviously, down low is going to get a lot of attention. What do you see in LSU's posts and Ladesia and Angel and the challenge they present? Um, they're really athletic. They can rebound a lot. Um, we just know that we're going to have to be, you know, physical and strong down there and not let them get too many uh, second chance opportunities because they'll definitely take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, we just have to play to our strengths also. Jermaine Farrell, WFXR in Roanoke. First of all, ladies, coach, great seeing y'all down here in Big D. This is for the ladies up on the stage. I got to ask you, now obviously, you know, locally we know how great you are and what y'all do, but what's it like finally to get this national attention? And, and obviously Taylor's showing off that great hat. That's got to be cool because you're bringing the swag. But, you know, what's it like to get this national recognition and attention y'all definitely deserve? Can we start with Georgia, please? Yeah, it's really good for the program, you know, what we've been striving for. <clears throat> Coach, sorry. <laughs> Coach Brooks has done a really good job um, inheriting the program and building it up to this, and obviously this is probably one of the, like, greatest things a team can achieve, right, being in the Final Four, aside from winning the whole thing. Um, but, yeah, just it's really surreal, really great for the program, and it's good that Virginia Tech is getting some noise. And Taylor? Yeah, uh, I'll just piggyback on that. Um, I'm proud of, of, of the team, of Coach Brooks, um, the vision that, that he's had. And I think it all started, obviously, in the locker room and making sure we all believed in, in the goals and what we were going to accomplish. And uh, honestly, trying to block out, out the noise, whether you're with us or against us, that's, it's not really going to change what we do. Um, but at the same time, it it's, do, does still feel good to be on the stage and have people recognize you for the hard work that we've been putting in all season. And Elizabeth. I agree. <laughs> That's good. No. 
Greg Riddle with the Dallas Morning News. This is for Coach Brooks. Um, is this right that you were at the 2017 Final Four in Dallas when UConn had its 111-game winning streak ended? I, I was, and it was a special, special uh, Final Four for me because I have a middle daughter, and um, Chloe, and uh, she was probably going through some tough challenges mentally. Uh, she had had an injury with her basketball career, and, uh, and it was a daddy-daughter date. And uh, we came here, we spent time together with each other, took her around, uh, kind of got a chance to show her how cool daddy was in the, in the halabis of the WBCA meetings. Um, and we sat there, up there, and we watched uh, the game, UConn and Mississippi State. Um, and we, we had the best time. And I wish I could give you a story, a, a Disney story ending, and a saying that, hey, baby, one day we're going to be here too. Um, but we, we didn't. But it was, a, it was a memorable moment. And to come full circle to know that 2023 I'm going to bring my team. Not, not like Taylor says, we're not at the Final Four. We're in the Final Four. And uh, that's a surreal moment and uh, something that now I get to bring my whole family, not just one kid, you know. And uh, that's something that not only we're experiencing, but all of our families are experiencing. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful moment. Have you used that as any kind of example to your kids that anyone can win the tournament no matter what their record is? Well, I've told these kids all along that they can win it. They have the talent to win it. Uh, they, just, they just weren't good enough to beat themselves and to try to beat these tough opponents. And they bought into that. They're, they're selfless. Uh, the most unselfish group I've ever been around in my life. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, all their individual trophies and accolades, they're in my office because they just haven't come to pick them up. Because so the, the only thing they want to do is win. And uh, so if you walk into my office, you might think that I'm a decorated basketball player with all the trophies in there. But that's just their unselfishness. And uh, that's what's gotten us here. Before moving on, we're going to take a question virtually and just want to remind you, we're going to take questions to the student athletes and then we'll do coach so we can dismiss the student athletes first. So again, we're going to take a question virtually. This will be from Chris Heidel. Chris, I'm going to unmute your line and you um, are able to then talk. Hey, this is Chris Heidel from Hermiton Radio in Baltimore. Congratulations, ladies, making it to the, uh, the Final Four. This is for the players. What is it like being representing this, the Commonwealth of Virginia and also representing the ACC as well? If we could start with Elizabeth. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not from Virginia originally, but the last you know four years that I've had there, um, I've just had a real connection with the community there, um, in Blacksburg especially. It's just a really special place, and Hokie Nation is incredible, so... I'm just so happy to be able to represent uh, that population, and it's cool to you know get somewhere where the program hasn't been before, um, and I'm just really glad that I'm doing it in a Hokies uniform. And Taylor? Yeah, no, it's been awesome. Uh, I've had people back on campus um, that work with like dining hall services texting, saying the whole campus is behind us, um, and it's a great feeling. Uh, because I feel like we're just kind of having fun and doing our job, but to know that people are genuinely looking up to us is awesome. And the same thing with people in the ACC, other teams are, are saying bring it home for the, for the conference. And so it's fun. It's, it's awesome. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say a few of the um, ACC girls that we play against all year round have reached out to me, and I know a lot of the other girls too, so it's pretty cool to see, you know, those girls getting behind you. Um, it obviously goes to show how great connection the ACC has and how um, it's prepared us for this. Alexa Philpu, ESPN, um, for the players. If you, each of you, I know, had different experiences uh, deciding to go to Virginia Tech, but what was it about Coach's vision specifically that made you realize this is, you know, something that I want to get on board with? Like, what was that? Like, you can, you can sell a vision, but for us, you know, not being in the room, what did that look like? And kind of for you, uh, for Georgia and Elizabeth being here, you know, getting recruited out of high school versus Taylor coming in as a transfer, if you could each kind of answer what that looked like. My story was definitely a little different because I was international and I never met Coach Brooks in person right. until I was in his office pretty much um, committing. <laughs> so I think he obviously did a really good job recruiting, selling the vision online. Um, and obviously I had a lot of other coaches recruiting me um, and I just didn't really feel that connection or that vibe. Um, and Coach Brooks was always just so genuine. Him and his staff, his whole coaching staff, um, had that vision. And I could just tell that it was a family. And for me to come all the way over here, I had to have that. Um, so a huge part of that was just the family feeling and the, like the vision that came along with it. Sitting in his office, I committed on spot, so he sold it pretty well. <laughs> 
Uh, I think for me, uh, it wasn't even when we talked like on a Zoom that he sold it to me. I think it was like just over the four years of getting to talk to him just after competition when I was at Boston College. Um, and you get a vibe, you get an energy from somebody in, in how you interact. Um, and it was always genuine. There was always a lot of respect there. So then when it came down to him recruiting me uh, to come to Virginia Tech, it was like, okay, I hear what you're saying. I, I see who you have on the, on the team. Um, and I've liked you as a competitor so far, and so it was, it was a pretty easy decision for me. Um, I committed like five years ago now, which is crazy, but that was after Coach Brooks had had a couple seasons, and I could already see the improvement that he'd made. Um, and I just knew that he had a vision, not just for the success of the basketball program, but also the culture, uh, and I felt like I could help out with that. So, um, yeah, it worked out pretty well. David Cunningham, Tech Sideline. Taylor, this is for you. Um, you. You mentioned blocking out the noise and, and making sure everybody in the locker room believes about the vision. Through the ups and downs this year, what do you think has been the key to you guys as a whole, just staying focused and locked in and, you know, even when people are saying whatever about you, being able to, to block out that noise? Is it the experience? Is it the fact that everybody's connected what do you think it is in your mind I think it's a mix of a whole lot of things I think it starts with having great people uh, on the team and I credit coach Brooks for recruiting not just great basketball players but great people um, who I can confide in and, and look at them and I think we all have the same goal and this insane desire to win um, and just have each other's backs. And I think Liz has touched on it a whole bunch. We're just having fun with each other. Um, and so why let outside noise that isn't going to change the outcome of, of a win or a loss distract you from those goals? Uh, and so it's been great um, being locked in, being motivated with this team. Um, and I, I think it does go to show how mature this group is. Um, and so it, it's great. From the New York Times uh, for Georgia and, and Liz, I know you, you talked some about this, but how did your friendship blossom, you know, ahead of the season, and how has it translated to the on the court play for y'all and like chemistry? Yeah, I, was, um, I think when I first got here, I was obviously I had no friends and no one really, um, <laughs> but I think that. <laughs> um, I always said that Liz's relationship with Raven, she's so caring and she's learned to like be passionate and emphatic and all of the above towards people in their situations. Um, so she just really reached out to me and helped me get comfortable with Virginia Tech um, and America. Like I was, I was not comfortable with America. Um, and then, you know, COVID hit and I lived with her. Um, and even though it was only like, what, two months? I can't even remember how long it was. Um, four, okay. Well, that's what I'm saying. It didn't even feel like that. Cause it was just like, I just got accepted into a home that was so like, comforting and welcoming. Um, so I would say COVID definitely helped with that. It was kind of by force, because um, she just you know, got immersed in all my family issues and whatever, like <laughs> she was just surrounded by it. So she had to learn me really well. And then in turn, I think you know, she felt more comfortable confiding in me. So I think that just helped us get really close. Um, and then translating on to basketball, we just have like that special relationship. Uh, and we spend so much time together. And Coach Brooks also helps us um, learn each other on the basketball floor. So that just translates into games. Yeah, Mitchell Northam uh, for the win. Georgia, um, I saw on Twitter that your parents are going to come to this game. Um, have they ever gotten the chance to see you play live in person in a Virginia Tech uniform? When, when was the last time? And how awesome is it to have them here? Yeah, so they both, my whole family, so my brother, sister, mom and dad came over last year. Um, so they saw about four or five games and then this year my mom came over, just herself. Um, I wasn't expecting them to come to the tournament, but they landed yesterday. Um, and mom was like, did you have any idea that we would come? I was like, no. <laughs> to be honest, no, because it's like a 16 hour flight direct. Um, but they got here and I'm, I'm very happy that they get to experience this because this is a whole different level than, you know, like, our, our home games are great, but, oh, my gosh, this stage is, like, incredible. Um, so I'm very happy that they get to experience it, too. Cheryl Coward, HoopFeed.com. Along those lines, you got to play in the arena where Australia's greatest basketball player played in her career. Um, what was that like and what kind of motivation did that give you? And um, have you heard from any of the Australian uh, stars and legends in your run up here? Yeah, when I first walked in, I saw her jersey hanging. That was pretty surreal moment. Um, but, you know, we won the game against Ohio State and she DM'd me, um, which was pretty cool. She reached out to me. And, you know, Sammy Whitcomb also plays for them and she 
reached out to me. So it's pretty cool to, you know, have that support back from home. Um, specifically, too, from the Seattle girls, obviously just from where we played those games. But it's been very, very cool. David Teal from the Richmond Times-Dispatch, Georgia. Coach Brooks mentioned the other day that in the bubble in San Antonio two years ago after the Baylor game, Coach Mulkey said to him, behind your mask, you should be smiling because I see potential in your team. That result notwithstanding, is, did that game teach you all anything? What were your emotions after that game? And did you think it was an encouraging moment, the result aside? Yeah, um, obviously learned a lot from that game. I remember walking up to the presser and Didi Richards walked past me and she fist bumped me and said, good job, baby girl. I was shaking, fist bumping her. I was like, oh my gosh, this is not real. But, you know, just to see like that Baylor team was incredible. Um, and to play against them, you know, it taught us a lot. They were a mature group. They were a confident group. Um, and I think, you know, it's translated now because I think we're mature and confident. Um, and we're playing on this stage that they did. Um, so, you know, it's been, a, it's been a journey, but I'm very happy to be a part of it. We're going to take our final two questions for the student athletes. Georgia, again, this is for Georgia. Just You talked about the Australian. Uh, LSU has last year Poe on her team. Are you familiar with each other? Did you play against each other? Any stories you could share? Yeah, so she, we're both from Victoria. She's from the metro, so the city. I'm from the country. So we played against each other, all juniors. Um, we even went over to India together as part of the national team. So I'm very familiar with LT. Um, great family. Her mom is so cute. Um, and I, I'm so proud of her because, you know, she went to JUCO, she came up, landed at um, LSU, and I'm so proud of her because she's, she's stuck through it, um, and, it's, and it's paying off for her. Um, for any of you, uh, I think, Liz, uh, before the Ohio State game, you had said, hey, this game's going to boil down to whether we handle the Ohio State press or not. What do you feel like tomorrow's game is going to boil down to? Taylor, let's have you answer that. Uh, it's definitely going to be rebounding and just being the tougher team, um, making sure that we're not playing back on our heels, um, just running our offense. And I think I said it the other day, it's, there's nothing that we have to do that's going to be different than what we've done to get us here. Uh, it's just going to be playing confident, playing together, uh, playing smart, limiting second chance opportunities, uh, and the rest will work itself out. Georgia, is this right that you grew up playing Australian rules football, cricket, and taekwondo against boys? Yeah, and swimming and track and netball, <laughs> and, yeah, everything. Did you feel like that helped you kind of develop a toughness that you've been able to bring into your college basketball career? Yeah, when I used to play football, I used to be really fast, and boys would grab my ponytail to stop me. Um, so I've definitely learned a lot from that. But in terms of toughness, you know, Football is purely about tackling and dodging all of those um, instances. So definitely helped me be tough. Definitely taught me that when I get hit, <laughs> get up, test it out, and then go out if you're really hurt. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. At this time, we'll take questions from Coach. Thank you. Kenny. Kenny, Andy, better from Tech Sideline. Uh, obviously, basketball is the family business for you. I'm curious, going back to when you took the Virginia Tech job, uh, what were those discussions like with your family uh, about leaving a pretty good situation at JMU? Were they on board? And did you imagine this was possible back then? Well, congratulations. Welcome back. Um, my family is everything to me. Uh, I played for Lefty Giselle. And uh, you know, Lef Lefty not only taught us basketball, but he taught us family and everywhere he everywhere we went family his family was there uh Ms. Drizel, even if I was mad at coach Drizel, Ms. Drizel would come up and give me a big hug and tell me that she loved me and that and that's something that has meant a lot to me uh when I was at James Madison I felt like I was so busy making a life that I wasn't living a life and it was a blur you know I watched my kids grow up and I missed a lot I missed a whole lot so when the Virginia Tech opportunity came along um my wife was on board because she understood that the challenges that I wanted to accomplish, I wanted to test my wits against the best. And she knew that. But my children had never moved. Unprecedented, they had never moved before in their lives. They lived in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Their grandparents lived there. Their cousins lived there. Their aunts, their aunts they had a normal life. They didn't have a coach's kid life. And, uh, and in turn, I taught them how to hate Virginia and Virginia Tech because we were James Madison and uh, we were always battling against them. So my oldest child, she was on board. Uh, my baby girl, she didn't know what was going on. She was just going where daddy and mommy went. 
And my middle child was reluctant. She says, I'm not going. <laughs> she says, I'm staying here. And ultimately, uh, one day I was sitting as I was contemplating, I was sitting on, the, uh, on my bed actually, and my middle child, Chloe, the one who came to the uh, tournament with me in 2017, she laid on the bed with me and she said, I don't wanna be the reason that you don't go out and, and get what you deserve. So she says, I'll go. And when she said that, I just lost it. And uh, right then and there, I knew that they were gonna be incorporated in everything that we did at Virginia Tech. And as a result, it's helped us, family atmosphere, uh, they're, they're around, the kids know them. Georgia and Liz come to my house all the time, whether I'm there or not, uh, to see my wife or to cook, to bake or do whatever. Um, so it's just really helped our culture, uh, incorporating my family into everything. And it's helped me become a better father. I've had more dinners at the dinner table with my kids since I've been at Virginia Tech than I ever imagined having at James Madison. Chris from the New York, New York Times. Uh, Georgia kind of has like a commanding presence on the court. Like how, how have you worked with her in developing that and, and honing that? You know what, she came here and immediately I knew we had something special. I told everyone, we, 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 I told everyone we stole one. And not just because of her basketball ability, but because of her work ethic, uh, her demeanor. Uh, and you know, she came over here in a very tough time. You know, COVID hit uh, two months into her being here. And uh, then the very next year, the season was cut short and she had five non-conference games before we threw her into the ACC battles. And she and I, I knew she was gonna be special and I challenged her and I coached her like that. And uh, if you had watched my practices with her, you might've thought it was child abuse because I was really going after her because I knew the toughness left that she needed. And she handled every bit of it, handled every bit of it. Uh, she has a very demanding, uh, not demanding, uh, her demeanor is, is a very one of confidence. Um, the kids will follow her. She's like the Pod Piper. You know, if she says, let's do this, the kids will do that. Uh, she's the funniest kid on the team. She's the most quick-witted kid on the team. Uh, and she's our leader. And, uh, and, you know, just, you know, she and Liz, uh, watching them too at practice, they'll go at each other. And it's funny, they speak a different language. But at the end, they respect each other so much. And that's a big reason we're here because of Georgia's toughness, mentally and physically. Coach, to your left. Skyler Dixon with the AP, a first time Final Four participant and yet a number one seed. How do you kind of use those two opposing things in your messaging? Well, the, well, the number one, uh, the number one seed uh, means that we belong here. Uh, we're, we're not, we're not a, a number six seed who's made a magical run uh, and it's very surprising. Uh, we should expect to be here. A lot of people should expect us to be here. Uh, but because of the name on the front, because it hasn't had the history that a Tennessee had or a UConn had, you know, people are really quick to doubt you. And, uh, and our kids have seen that. They, like they mentioned, they are basketball junkies. They know everything that Charlie Cream says. They know everything. They know where they are, bracketology, every second. They know everything. I can text, before I can text them because somebody made a really good move, they're texting me, did you see that move that such and such made? They're basketball junkies. So when they see everything that's written about them and people writing them off, I love the way that they've handled it. They're not angry. They're not angry like we're going to prove you wrong. All right, they're so confident in themselves. They're like, okay, we're going to prove ourselves right. We know how good we are. We know we belong here. We know we are a number one seed. We didn't just happen to get lucky to get a number one seed. We beat a lot of really good basketball teams convincingly. And uh, we expect to have that. So as a result, being here is not a surprise. We're very fortunate. We understand it, that it takes a lot of hard work and some luck. Uh, but we expect to be here. And Coach, to your right. Jermaine Farrell, WFXR in Roanoke. Coach. Dallas Cowboy fan, you're here in Dallas. Have you had any of the Cowboys reach out to you, anyone from the organization <laughs> to come out to AT&T Stadium or come out to the Star? Because you know, you're, you're here now. We talked about it earlier. It said it would be a dream to be here, and now you're here. So has Jerry reached out to you, anybody? No, no I, I haven't, haven't. But I tell you what, um, I got a text, a direct text from, uh, from uh, oh, a tweet, I'm sorry, a tweet and from Magic Johnson. And uh, that put me on cloud nine. I was a fanboy when I got that. So I've already got my staff, you know, going to print it out, put it on a, a, a big cutout, put it in my man cave uh, for anybody to come and see. Uh, but then, then a really cool moment. I mean, I mean I've, I've watched the video a hundred times. Uh, I'm a big Dodgers fan, big Dodgers fan. My grandfather, people ask me, why are you a Dodgers fan? Uh, my grandfather grew up 
watching Jackie Robinson and everything that he accomplished breaking down barriers. And I just became a Dodgers fan because my grandfather was a Dodgers fan. And then he talked to me about the history. So I'm a big, big Dodgers fan. Uh, and Dave Roberts reached out and he sent me a video message. And he said, when I got it, I saw his face. And I'm like, what is this? And, uh, and it says, he started off, he said, Coach Brooks. And I'm like, he said my name. <laughs> And it was personalized, and he talked about the culture. He's watching our games and the culture that is uh, emulated through. I mean, just resonates through the TV. And, uh, and at the end of it, he says, um, first he said, I hope to see you at a game. So I, I took that as an invitation, so I'm going to take it up on it. But uh, he, said, he said, go Dodgers and go Hokies. And that's two of my favorite teams, and that's all I needed right there. So it, it was a special moment for me um, and for him to reach out because he's somebody that – you know, I try to emulate, you know, his persona and the way that he goes about his business. Back here to your left. Hey, Kenny, Anthony Romano, WDBJ, congratulations on getting to this point. Does LSU remind you of any of the opponents that you faced during the season or during this run? And how do you feel as if your ACC schedule and, and, and the, the talent that was in the conference this year has prepared you for this stage? Yes, uh, LSU, extremely well coached. Uh, they're physical, they're fast, they're tough, they're confident. Uh, and it, it reminds me a lot of the team we played two games ago in Tennessee. We played Tennessee twice this year and uh, very similar styles uh, in what they do. They rely, they're very reliant on their athleticism, their length, uh, their ability to rebound the basketball. Uh, so I think that game has prepared us. Both of those games have prepared us. Um, we played two games earlier in, in the Bahamas. We played against Kentucky and uh, Missouri, and maybe they're not as talented as those groups, but they play a very similar style, very physical. And then, then when we went through the ACC, we have a lot of good teams in the ACC. Uh, and to go through our conference and get the championship, we had to go through Miami, who was in the Elite Eight. They play a very similar style. Uh, it was on display when they played against LSU. Uh, we had to play against um, Duke, who plays a very similar style, very physical, reliant on the press, pressure. Uh, and then we had to play Louisville. Uh, who was also in the Elite Eight to get to the championship. So I think our schedule has really prepared us for moments like this because of the way that teams have played. Um, and, and I think our kids have seen it all. You know, Elizabeth, I, we don't know what kind of coverage they're going to get, but we've seen it all and, uh, and we'll adapt to whatever they're going to do, whether it's single coverage, whether it's double, whether it's triple. Um, and so we'll, we'll be ready. Coach, right over here to your left. Okay. Hi, Kenny. Uh, Scott Rabelais with The Advocate in Baton Rouge. Um, obviously, uh, both teams have benefited from, from the transfer portal. But in this era of the transfer portal, NIL, for, to do what Coach Mulkey has done so quickly at LSU, to join that handful of coaches who've led multiple programs to the Final Four, what, what does that say about the, what the job you think she's done from a coaching perspective, knowing how even more difficult it is to build a program in yeah, this era. Yeah, she, she's, uh, she's capitalized on the opportunity with the transfer portal, uh, but she's done it the right way. A lot of people want to go into the transfer portal and they want to, um, they just want to collect, have a collection of talent. You know, this kid averaged 14 points at such and such. Maybe they, they should be able to do that here. Well, it's not always the case. Uh, and, and she's done what we've done, and we've gone out and got kids who are a good fit for your program, not just because their, their, their stats are really good. Um, and she's done that. And, you know, she has some personalities on that group, and she's the person to, to really handle it, uh, that situation. And she's taken them, and, you know, they've sacrificed a lot, you know, for the betterment of their team. And, uh, and it shows because the way they played and the way they've been here, I think they've, only, well, they've lost one, two games this year. And um, that's special. I don't care who you play. They play in the SEC, and they've only lost two games all year long. So she's done a magnificent job. We have another virtual question from Chris. We'll take that at this time. Chris, if you could unmute your line. Hey, Coach Brooks. It's Chris Idell from Herbert from Radio and Baltimore. Thanks for taking my question, and congratulations on making it in Dallas. Have you heard from anybody from Harrisonburg, you know, Virginia? Has anybody reached out to you and said, hey, congratulations, or any, anybody from the old area? Oh, sure, absolutely. I probably have about 300 unread messages right now. And, and if you are listening from Harrisonburg uh, or whoever has reached out, I promise you I'm not trying to be big time. I just don't have time to get to it. And uh, I'll have time, you know, next week to try to, to, to answer all of them. But um, I did hear from Coach Rizel. Uh, I got a, got a message from him, uh, which is very, very special. But uh, I know there's a lot of supporters in, in Harrisonburg uh, in particular. Uh, I, think, I think I've done a really good job of, of kind of converting a lot of people in the Shenandoah Valley into uh, Virginia Tech fans. So that's, that's, a big, that's a big feat in itself. Hey, Coach, Doug Feinberg, the AP. 
done. I was talking to one of your friends the other day who said, who's been in the spot you're in right now and said that his advice to you was to take a second and enjoy the moment and not just focus on basketball because that's the obviously the thing to do, but to take a second and soak it all in. Have you had a chance to do that yet or is it just, I got a game tomorrow, I'm focused on that? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've heard from a lot of different people who've been in this situation. Uh, Quentin Hillsman, who I probably you're probably referencing, uh, who was here in my in my uh, situation a few years back. As a matter of fact, uh, Syracuse went to the to the Final Four, the final game, uh, the year that I was hired at Virginia Tech. And uh, when I took the job, and you know, you're always trying to win the press conference. And uh, and I remember saying, well, if Syracuse can do it, why can't we? And there was a huge eruption. Everybody was like, yeah, we can do it. And then immediately I was like, did I just stick my foot in my mouth? Uh, because it's a, it's a very tough task to get here. Uh, but I've heard from Quentin. I've, I've heard from Jeff Walls. I've heard from Mike Neighbors. I've heard from Kelly Graves. And they all said the same thing. Enjoy the process. Enjoy it. Enjoy it because it's not easy to get here. And, he, and they said, you have a mature group. They're well coached. Uh, you know what you're going to do, and I know you guys are going to get down to business, but make sure you allow the kids and yourself to enjoy the process, and, uh, and we've been doing that. We'll take our final question. Berman, the Roanoke Times. Uh, Kenny, uh, do you feel like Angel Reese is perhaps the best player you've gone up against this season, and what are the kind of the keys to, to dealing with her uh, tomorrow? Well, I mean, obviously, she's, uh, she's tremendously talented. Uh, she, has a, she has great stats, uh, but I, I don't want to discredit anybody that we've already played against because we have not played against her live. Uh, we played against some great kids. Uh, I mean, look at, look at the two that we played against in Tennessee. They're as talented as anyone in the country. Uh, we've been able to play against them. Uh, Mike, so the other night, uh, she felt, I looked like she was Steph Curry. Uh, I was just like smiling sometimes when she was hitting some of the shots that she was hitting. But obviously, when you get to this level, you're going to play against very, very tough, talented players. And uh, we know we're going to have our hands full, but, um, you know, the kids will go out and they'll execute the game plan. And, and we're not going to shut her down. We're, we're not, we don't expect to do that, but we just want to make it tough for her and put her in situations uh, and where she's not comfortable. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, guys. As a reminder, a recording of this press conference will be posted in the NCAA Digital Hub at www.ncaa.veritone.com.
The Division I National Semifinal Game 1 press conference featuring the LSU Tigers will begin momentarily. We will hear an opening statement from Coach Moki and then follow with questions for student athletes Alexis Morris and Angel Reese. The student athletes will then be dismissed and we will open up questions for Coach. As a reminder, please make sure your cell phones are on silent. We will get started in five minutes. When called upon, please state your name and affiliation. There are wireless microphones on each side of the room. Please wait until the microphone reaches you before stating your question. For those joining remotely, please use the raise hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. When you are called on for your question, please unmute your line and state your name and affiliation. Again, we will begin in approximately four minutes.
Good morning and welcome to the Division I National Semifinal Game 1 press conference featuring the LSU Tigers. We will hear an opening statement from Coach Mulkey and then follow with questions for the student athletes Alexis Morris and Angel Reese. The student athletes will then be dismissed and we will open up questions for Coach. Please make sure your cell phones are on silent. When called upon, please state your name and affiliation. There are wireless microphones on each side of the room please wait for the microphone to reach you before stating your question. For those joining remotely, please use the raise hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. When you are called on for your question, please unmute your line and state your name and affiliation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Again, we'll open up with a statement, opening statement from coach, then we will field questions to the student athletes. We'll then dismiss the student athletes and then open up questions for coach. I don't have an opening okay. statement, so let's do it. All right, let's go straight to the questions for the student athletes. Michael Cobble, WBRZ TV in Baton Rouge for Alexis. Uh, just Georgia, I'm sure you saw her game, the game that she plays, you know, commanding that team. I guess just from a guard's perspective, what kind of matchup is she? Um, she's a great player. Um, what kind of player am I? It's going to be a good matchup. Fine, Peter, for, from the uh, advocate in Baton Rouge, just for both players, uh, would you talk about the last four days and, and the uh, gamut of your emotions uh, and how this is different from just being in the NCAA tournament, being at the Final Four? Um, I was just telling my teammates, I don't think it has hit me yet that I'm actually in the Final Four. I, I just, I don't know, I was like, it's just like another game, another tournament, but like I'm actually in the Final Four. And I, I don't realize how big this is just yet. Maybe when I see the arena tomorrow, I mean, yeah, tomorrow and like get to the game, but like, I'm excited. Like, we're trying to keep our emotions down, of course, because this is a lot of our first time, but just being able to stay focused, we've been really focused on Scout these last four days. So just being able to do what we've been doing all year. What Angel said. For Angel, this is Lauren from Valley Sports. You have a lot of young fans, girls and boys who look up to you. I'm just curious how you prepare yourself to show up on big stages like this, but also all throughout the NCAA tournament, how you show up for your team, obviously, but also for the young young ballers. Um, kind of, I'm at a point where everything I do is being watched. So just trying to be a leader and just trying to influence the youth. Um, I've always had people when I was young, when I was younger that I could look up to and just being able to be that person when they get older and have that picture. I don't know if you saw the picture of me and Simone um, when I was young, like seven or eight, and she was in the WNBA. So hopefully one day I can remake that picture with someone. So I never know the impact on somebody's life and how somebody's day is going. So I just try to inspire as much as I can. Mark uh, Berman, The Roanoke Times. Uh, Angel, uh, I was curious, what's been the key for you this season that I'm sure even though most opponents, you know, the number one goal is to kind of keep you off the glass and keep you from getting second chance uh, shots, you're still able to do it? Um, just focusing on finishing around the basket. I think coming to LSU, I've gotten in way better shape and I've gotten much stronger. So just being able to, I think that has helped me a lot. And I haven't been in foul trouble until like these last few games um, all season. So just trying to stay together. And I think my teammates and coaches have putting me in a really good position where they give me the ball a lot. And also just whenever they miss a shot, I try to get the rebound as best as I can. To your right. Uh, Gabby Bream, her hoop stats. This is for both players. Angel, you mentioned you guys are really focused on the scout. I just wanted to know what types of information is most useful to you from the scouting report. Um, personnel just paying attention to your player that you'll be guarding or players that you'll potentially be guarding, knowing their tendencies, knowing their positive and negatives, just knowing their strengths and weaknesses. So I think that's just important within the season. And right now, I mean, you can look at the conference, you can look at out of conference, but then you can look at NCAA and how they're performing right now. So just being able to pay attention to that right now. I would agree personnel is most important, just knowing their tendencies and, you know, the team tendencies, you know, their offense, their defense, just the details of small things, sweating the small things. Oh, we have paper. We have, we have paper Both. scout and then film. So, yeah. Both. Both, yeah. yeah. Chessa Boucher with WVLA in Baton Rouge. Lex, 
back in your home state also. How you feeling, but where's your cowboy hat? I know, right? I was like, um, when I seen Coach Moki coming down the stairs with her cowboy hat, I was like, man, I wanted to wear mine. I forgot to put it on. But I'm super excited. Um, I've changed my goal now. I'm in Dallas. Now I want to have my senior night on Sunday. So um, my focus has shifted, and I hope my team, I know my team focus is, is, this, is, a, is, is, is the same as mine. Good. Um, same for Alexis. Um, you have kind of been a part of the point guard position, changing, scoring, being able to pass the ball. I'm curious of what you look for in games in regards to when you need to go get yours and when it's best to get other people involved. It kind of starts in film, just knowing the type of team we're going to be facing and just getting a feel for the game, like through the course of the game and just being able, just being cognizant of when it's time for me to go score the ball and when I do need to pass the ball and be poised. I just got to like, it's always it's just, it's based on a feel for what my team need at that time. And then I'm listening to Coach Moki, what she needs me to do for the team. Um, but I don't know if you know, I've always been a point guard my whole life. So this is just my natural position and what I'm used to doing. So, yeah. Hey ladies, Corey Diaz uh, with the USA Today Network. Uh, I saw a report last night, and want to get both of your guys' thoughts on it, um, where walk up to the door, standing room tickets for the women's Final Four is more expensive than uh, the men's tournament in Houston. Just as a player uh, in a women's basketball right We're literally watching the game grow and change right in front of our faces, and we're playing a, um, a huge part in it, and it's just like, it's, it's an honor, it's an honor. And I'm just super excited to, you know, be a part of it. I'm watching Angel. Like, Angel's one of the main faces, and it's just, like, inspiring as well. Skyler Dixon with the AP. Angel, uh, down here, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's like a movie theater right here in the front. <laughs> um, the matchup with Liz is gonna, people are going to be talking a lot about that. How do you balance trying to put your imprint on a game like this but not try to do too much to win a matchup like that? Yeah, no, it's never about a matchup. It's all a team effort. So we're going to take her as anybody, other post player that we played all year. I mean, we played South Carolina as well. So just being able to pay attention to detail, like I said, on, on scout, knowing her tendencies, the positive and the negative. So all together, we're going to have to take care of her, but not just her. They're also a great team. They play together as a great team. So I don't think they can just win with, with just her. I think we have to take care of business, all five positions, and everybody has to guard the ball. Up to the front, yes. Yeah, um, M.A. Vopel from ESPN.com. Um, Angel and Alexis, if you guys both um, want to answer this, you, you guys obviously saw Simone's statue go up outside the arena. Uh, you guys have been part of this, I, I don't know, resurrection, maybe, maybe too strong a word, but you know what I mean, the, the rebuilding of LSU. What does it mean to you to be part of that and the feeling you're getting from these longtime LSU fans who remember the Sylvia Fowles days and the Simone Augustus days that – that they're able to experience this again with you guys? I mean, yeah, when I came to LSU, I kind of told Coach I wanted to bring this program back to where it was. And then on top of that, having Coach Bob Starkey, he was already here with them when they when they had been on that run, that Final Four run. So just being able to do it for the fans. I mean, they've waited a long time to see this 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 program get to back to where they wanted to be. So just being able to do it for them and then making history again, like just coming back to what Alexis said. So I'm excited. When I was at Texas A&M, you know, I played for Coach Starkey. He would always tell me about LSU, his days at LSU. Like, he just loved LSU. And I was like, well, Coach, I think you should, you know, kind of go back home. Like, you, you love, you love LSU. And I'm actually here now and I can experience and I feel what he was talking about when I was at Texas A&M. The fans, the history, it's like a marathon, like. And it's just so like exciting to be a part of it and to be a part of the rebuild. And you know, I came, to, I came, I joined, rejoined Coach Moki to rebuild the program. So it's just, it's just an amazing feeling. Angel, staying right here in the front. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Megan Lover, KTC in Lafayette. Um, two quick ones for you. You talked about Alexis. You know, being this a homecoming for her. Obviously, you want to. You, this is a full team effort, but the homecoming for her, Samaya, how much do you mm -hmm. want it for them? And then my second one. We talked about the underdog role just about all season. How much does that motivate you? Yeah, so the first question, I mean, of course I want to do it for my Texas girls coming back home. It's no better home, place than home. So being able to first do it for the seniors, I mean, this is their last time. 
being able to play. These, these could be their last two final games of their college career. So just being able to go out with a bang. I told Alexis that we were going to get to Dallas. So now she has a new goal is to get to Sunday. So just being able to do it for them and then just playing that underdog role, I think that has got us to where we are right now. All year, our non-conference schedule was weak. The SEC was weak, and we're here now. So just being able to be humble and just staying, staying down, I think that's what Coach has emphasized on all year. Play the underdog, play the underdog role. Because when you do beat them, it's just like, oh, oh, okay. We believe in each other in the locker room, and as long as we got each other, we'll go as far as we can. Uh, Matthew Bruni, Bruni with on three. Uh, Alexis, how important has Kateri Poole been over the past three, four games in this tournament run, and how do you expect her to, to perform on this week? Kateri has, Kateri has been a key success, I mean, a, 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 good, a key piece to our success. She's um, taking on every role that coach has asked her to be, whether it's her being a point guard position, a defensive stopper, um, whatever it is, she's just been, a, she's been coachable and willing to do whatever the team needs. And it also helps me just having another, being confident in another guard with experience. I mean, she's been amazing. She's been a, a great piece to our puzzle. To your left. Chesa Boucher, WVLA. Angel, what have you seen from Lex knowing that this is her home state? This is, she's shifted her focus now, and this is, I mean, could potentially be it for her with you at LSU. I mean, I know Lex has been on a journey, and it's no better place than finishing at home. So I know this is exciting for her. Um, I'm happy for her that she never gave up, and being able to be in this moment where she's just, she has rise. I know she's not done yet, but just to see how much she has grown throughout the season and her maturity, it's been amazing. So being able to do it, just not just for Alexis, but all the Texas girls that were able to come back home. I know Samaya, we went to DeSoto yesterday, being able to play at her court. So I think it's just really fun for all of us. Amanda Kristovich from Front Office Sports. Um, Angel, you're obviously at the top of the women's game on the court, but also with NIL deals. How have you been balancing um, being at the top, both on and <laughs> off the court, and per like particularly during the tournament? It's been a lot. Um, I kind of set myself to only post in certain days, and today, this before 12, is the last time I'll be posting. So just trying to have a schedule of everything going on because social media has taken over. And I mean, NIO is just what, what, what the game has come to. So it, it is hard and stressful, but the lady I work with, Janine, she has been amazing and has helped me through a lot of this stuff. So shout out to her, but it's hard, it's hard. We're gonna take our final two questions for the student athletes right here on our left. Yeah, for either of you, um, what have you liked about how your team has been playing defensively lately that you wanna replicate and, and uh, recapture tomorrow? And then offensively, is there any areas of improvement you're looking to build upon from, from the Miami game? Let's start with Alexis. Um, as far as defense, I think we're playing pretty solid defense right now. We're all on one accord. We're clicking. We're talking. We're communicating. But our offense, we haven't shot the ball well, and that's obviously a goal. You know, we haven't put on a bit our best showcase yet, and it's going to be key these last two games or for our next game on Friday that we come together, you know, and play a complete game. But we're not we're not stressing the offense. You know, that's going to come. But long as the only thing we can't control is our defense. And Angel. Oh, yeah. Same thing Alexis said. I mean, I know if we can't make, make shots, we'll play defense. And I think that's just something that we've emphasized on. I don't know. We've had a handful of games where we, where we pulled a full game together offensively and defensively where we shot well, and we're here. So luckily we get it to see another day. As long as you get to see another day, and we get to see tomorrow and have the opportunity to play again. So I'm just excited. And our last question up here in the front. Uh, yes, for both ladies. I know LSU's been to this final four or five different times, but never gotten to the championships. Kim obviously has. Has she told you that anything changes when you get here? Anything to be prepared for? Anything to take that next step? It's when to go home. I mean, the teams that stay together, the teams that fight together, the teams that just are focused, those are the teams that excel to the championship game. And she's been to championship games, and she has won championship games. So... She even told us in the C-16 game, she said, y'all get us to the Elite Eight, we can get you to the Final Four. So now it's, you get us to that, you, you win this game, we get, I'll get you to the championship and win that championship. So just trusting in the coaches. Of course, they've been here before and just, just trying to believe as much as we can. What Angel said, but I'm also going to say, I think all four teams here are great teams. We're all good teams. We wouldn't be in the Final Four if we weren't. But I think 
the teams who've made it to this point were the mental tough teams. And the team who's going to be the last one standing will be, it'll be based on who can be the, the, more, the more mental tough team. And it's going to be based off who can fight through adversity, who can fight through bad cause, who can fight through physicality. It's going to come down to the little things. And, you know, we, we've been preparing for this, for these moments. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. At this time, we'll open up it for questions for Coach. We'll start here over with Doug. Morning, Coach. Doug Feinberg, the AP. How much does experience play into the Final Four? I mean, you've been here many times with other teams. Virginia Tech is their first time. How much does that help dealing with not just on the court, but media, all the other events that go into the Final Four besides actually what happens on the court for an hour and a half? Well, Doug, I'm the only one in our locker room that has done this, but I'm not going to shoot, dribble, pass, guard any of them. So it's not a matter of what I have done. I look at it this way. It may be their first time to be in this situation, but they're all seniors. They're all seniors. It's the first time for my group to be in this situation as well, and we're not all seniors. So I think they have the edge on experience. Uh, all I'm going to do is tweak a thing here or there throughout the course of the game, but um, it has nothing at all to do with coaching and how long a coach has been somewhere or how many times a coach has been somewhere. Uh, Ricardo LeCompte, WDO TV in New Orleans. Uh, I just want to shift gears real quick, just kind of talking about uh, you've mentioned tick ball so many times where you've grown up. Um, is there one or two memories, uh, athletic memories, that you could probably share with us, whether it was you know, playing pickup games in that gym uh, at the middle school or why you had your nickname Spark Plug um, playing? And two, is it more satisfying for this Final Four run since the connection you have, basically essentially doing it in your own backyard? Um, there are lots of memories when you're growing up that are impactful. I think Dixie Youth Baseball was a big impactful moment in my life when I was kicked out of a dugout because I was a girl and it was the all-star game and I uh, couldn't even sit in the dugout. The impact of that I won't ever forget. Uh, growing up, uh, going to the gyms down Highway 51 in Tanchapaho Parish, uh, playing on Sunday nights uh, with older guys and my dad, they let me play. Um, but uh, memories are all we have in life until they're gone. Uh, coming back to Louisiana uh, was easy. Uh, the only thing different is all my family and friends were fatter, were older, were more wrinkled, we have more gray. Uh, the second part of your question, it's ironic kind of that um, in two years uh, at LSU, my LSU team is in a Final Four in a state that was very good to me, uh, not far from an institution that was very good to me. And uh, I would imagine there are going to be lots of Baylor people sitting in our section. Uh, I just had breakfast with Odyssey Sims, one of the greatest to play here. I've been on the phone with lots of former players. Um, when before we walked up down these stairs, I said, oh, nothing's changed. We're going to go down these deep stairs that are real narrow. A uh, lot of wonderful memories. Coach, we're going to go to your right. Amanda Kristovich from Front Office Sports. Um, over the past several years, obviously, the women's Final Four has grown so much. Um, in your opinion, what would you like to see the NCAA do to continue to grow it, to make it even bigger? Oh, I'm not smart enough to give you those answers right now. I've seen uh, things I agree with through the years, and I've seen things I don't agree with. Um, but I can't invest much time in all of that. I just try to coach basketball. I'll give opinions, certainly. Uh, but um, yeah, it's pretty neat that uh, it's sold out. The cheapest ticket is more expensive than the cheapest ticket in Houston for the men's Final Four. I thought that was eye-catching. Um, and Angel's right. These young ladies and their families have to sit up high. I would like to see their families be allowed to sit down low and buy those tickets or save a section for the families where they can go hug their families afterwards. And the way it's set up now is you only get a certain allotment of tickets and their families usually are not close to the court. And uh, 
what is it, $325, I think I was told, for them to go buy extra tickets for everybody because they're only allotted so many tickets. Maybe those are things that would I come to mind right off the top of my head. Hey, Coach, we're going to go to your left, please. Hey, Coach, Robbie Fueling, Spectrum News 1 in Dallas. Uh, just going off of what you said earlier, just about all the Baylor fans just you know cheering you on personally, um, I spoke to one of your first point guards at Baylor, Nicole Collins. She's now one of the high school coaches out here at Cedar Hill. Um, can you just talk about just the relationship you have with your former players and how special that is just to keep in contact after all these years? Well, first of all, let me make it clear. You're not in contact with all your former players. Some don't like you. And then you've got those that you stay in contact with. Those that don't like you, it's usually one of three reasons. You either had to discipline them really hard, dismiss them, or they didn't get enough playing time. But you hope that when your career is over that – you know, you have more that love you and like you and appreciate you than don't. And I think, as I tell them all the time, college are the greatest years of your life, period. They're the greatest years of your life. You're not paying bills. You're not changing diapers usually. Uh, you're just getting to, to do what everybody would love to do, go to school for free and play basketball. Nicole, I inherited at Baylor. She was one of my, if not, well, she and Sheila Lambert were my two guards. Uh, so proud of her. She's been able to go to state championships in the state of Texas, um, and it's going to be good to see them. I'll have some of them out on the court here in a minute that were on the very first 2005 national championship team. Uh, that's why you coach. You coach to impact lives, and you may not realize it as a student athlete the impact a coach has until 10, 20, and 30 years down the road. Coach, to your right. Uh, Gabe, you her hoop stats. Congrats on getting back here, Coach. Um, so I have kind of two questions about scouting. Uh, what's the inputs that are most useful for you? Is it film on common opponents, opponents you think resemble, you know, Virginia Tech, or just the most recent tape? And then what's the process of getting that down to the players in kind of sound bites that they can use on the court? A lot of our film sessions are done together, first of all. Throughout the course of the year, we will do individual uh, clips of people they will guard and send to them individually. Bob Starkey, my associate head coach, is a film junkie. I have to basically run him out of the room. <coughs> I'm more of, I want to see the most recent films. I want to share the most recent films with our team. Um, does that answer it? All right. To your left again, Coach. Over here, Matthew Bruni with on three. Um, what makes Georgia Amor such a tough guard to defend, and how do you decide what kind of matchups you want to throw at her with the variety of guards you have? Well, her range is unlimited. Uh, you could put her in the uh, category like Caitlin Clark. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, after Clark, you probably have her as the second or third most three-point shot attempts in the country. Uh, she has an unbelievable step back move that takes her either f even further away from the three point line. Uh, she gets her teammates involved. Uh, they use Kitley in such a way where she's not just a back to the basket big girl. She can face you up, she can put it on the floor. They push the ball extremely well in transition. You have to fan out and not get caught and sucked in into the paint. Um, she's just. From the time I saw her in the bubble till now, whew, somebody has done some tremendous work with her. Coach, we're going to go to your back um, in the right corner. Hi, uh, uh, Coach Smokey. I'm Bill Roden with ESPN Landscape. Uh, congratulations about everything. Thank you. Um, just curious, you, you just referenced a little while ago about being in the dugout, being kicked out of the dugout. So you've experienced in your career being kicked out, being left out. Uh, my question now, there's this tug of war with transgender athletes. Um, has you being uh, kept out informed how you feel about this new tug of war about transgender athletes? Do you see this kind of being worked out in the next 5, 10, 15 years? I, 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 I hope I answer this in a very sensitive way because um, I think we all know transgenders. I think we all know people who may not, may not be like we are. Um, I had a conversation with Debbie Antonelli. She has a special needs child. And we found the Special Olympics for them, didn't we? 
We found a place for them to compete. And I think that with time, maybe you will see a league or something for transgender um, athletes. I just think that I'm sensitive to those on one side, and yet I'm also sensitive to those on the other side. Does that make sense? Is that a good politically correct answer so I don't get in trouble? Huh? Um, I'm sorry, what was it? You're going to find this extremely interesting. When this topic became apparent, when I was at Baylor, I had that conversation with the athletic director. And I'll leave it at that. So I was kind of ahead of the curve. I had a conversation. What if? I never got an answer. And I'll leave it at that. But I was very much aware. Uh, but I also want you to know that I have conversations with transgender people who don't believe that they should be competing against biological females. And I find that real interesting. Uh, so you, you ask questions. You're, you're human. You want to hear sides of stories and, and come up with what you think. But at the end of the day, um, nobody cares what I think. <laughs> nobody cares. But thanks for asking that. Coach, we're going to move to your left. Scott Rapalay with the Baton Rouge Advocate. Kim, uh, making this move uh, as you did to a new school in this era with the, the transfer portal and NIL, all the, all the challenges that didn't exist when you started coaching, how, how difficult has that been? How has, and what's been invigorating about making this move to try to rebuild a program Maybe it's a little different from building from nothing, basically, at Baylor, but what is, how has that been for you personally? Well, Scott, it's, it's energized me um, to go back home, to see familiar faces, and know that those people will now buy season tickets just because they know me. What I didn't know would happen so quickly was the transfer portal and the number of student athletes I would get in the portal. I don't deal with NIL. I don't deal with um, all of that because it's too much. I don't even have social media. If somebody tells me something's on social media, they will have to send it to me. So what I did, if you'll remember, I put one of our assistants in charge and she got a new title to work with the NIL department in athletics at LSU because I don't wanna learn all that. I don't wanna know. I have no clue what Angel and Flage, I don't know who they have deals with. I don't want to know. All I care about is that it doesn't affect anything in that locker room, and it doesn't. They share whatever things they get from their, um, um, you call it sponsors or their NIL people, they share it with their teammates. They give out purses and headphones and all kinds of stuff. I don't have a clue. Now, you also have to know there is that component of each institution has the collective now where student athletes within the athletic department and have those donors I don't deal with that either that's someone on my staff don't want to don't want to deal with it it's too much I just want to coach but it's here to stay so we better embrace it go back to uh, when it started LSU may have been the first big time institution that embraced NIL and it was all over Times Square and it was NILSU if you remember. Olivia Dunn, our gymnast, was all over Times Square and the big, you know, screens. So kudos to LSU for being um, proactive because I think it's here to stay. Uh, Berman, the uh, Roanoke Times, uh, having played Virginia Tech two years ago, uh, as you prepare for them this week, are there certain, in certain ways you found Tech to be a, a tougher challenge this time around or a, a different kind of challenge this time around to prepare for? Well, heck yeah. I just told you. They're all seniors. They, they're they're battle-tested. Um, now, I don't have the same team uh, that I had at Baylor, uh, so you can't compare that. But... They're seniors, they're experienced, they're on a roll, they're confident. They've been together a while now. He's a great coach, love him to death. Um, sure, they'll be nervous, but my team will be nervous too because they're all doing it. Both teams will be doing it for the first time. We're gonna come up to the front, M.A. Yeah, um, M.A. Vopel, ESPN.com. Um, 
Coach, can you talk a little bit about how Angel's been successful against all different types of defenses? And I know you said earlier, obviously, Kitley is not just a low block player, but she's big. Um, how Angel operates against those types of players versus maybe other types of defenses? Right. Well, first of all, I don't know that Kitley will be guarding Angel. Uh, and nobody knows if Angel will be guarding Kitley. Um, Angel has been double team. She is outstanding at passing out of the double team and finding the open player. She has been guarded one-on-one -on -one by the bigger player. Angel is not a true back-to-the-basket player. She likes to take you off the dribble. Sometimes she tries to do too much, um, and I just tell her to relax. We'll find you on ball reversal. Um, I don't think Virginia Tech is the Kitley show or the Angel show. There's too many weapons around them. Uh, but Angel figures out a way to get in there and battle rebounding. She gets a lot of her own misses, um, and she just is strong. She's very, very strong. And uh, sometimes I forget how big Angel is until you stand next to her. She's a little bit bigger than you realize. Uh, but it, it's not anything she hasn't seen. We know Kitley's going to block shots. She should. But it doesn't mean that we're going to change our approach on the offensive end because of, of size. Coach, to your left, we're going to take our final s set of questions. Uh, Chessa Boucher with WVLA in Baton Rouge. Coach Mulkey, Lex said that she has shifted her focus. Maybe the games that we've seen from Lex, she doesn't shoot well. She really is able to clamp down defensively. What have you seen from her, and especially knowing the guard play that you guys will face against Virginia Tech? Alexis can hit big shots. She may go over for a while, but shoot it again, and she's going to hit the big three. Her speed and quickness is just an asset. She can get through screens, under screens, up screens. She, can just, she just has that quickness about her. Uh, the latter part of your question was, Well, she's faced a lot of great ones, so let's, let's give some little props here to the SEC. Uh, there's a lot of great players in the SEC. There's a lot of great guards in the SEC. Uh, I don't think that she takes the approach. I think that's probably, I'm not going to answer for her, but probably why she was short with your question a while ago because she feels like she's good too. And uh, it, it's going to be a great matchup. I don't know that great players ever stop each other. They're all going to get what they need to get for their teams to be successful. I think always it's going to end up being somebody that's the unsung hero. Right up here in the front. Hey, Kim. Corey Guess with the USA Today Network. Two questions for you. Two weekends ago, as a true freshman, Flage comes out, has the kind of performance that she has on the biggest stage for her up to that point. Is that still yeah, on the final four stage? Is that still your expectation of how she will be able to and sort of embrace the atmosphere and, and be able to perform? And then, to is is the hat a, a win in Rome type situation? The too? hat? Okay, well, the flage question is, let's go back to the South Carolina game earlier this year. Um, I think flage would sit here and go, what a learning experience. And if you know flage that child outworks anybody probably that I've ever coached. She never sleeps. She leaves practice and goes and starts doing rap stuff. And since the South Carolina game, I have seen little things improve in practice. I'm talking about on the floor, but in practice that she took to heart. If I had to just say the difference between the big stage tomorrow and that big stage at South Carolina, I'm going to go back to the experience factor. Virginia Tech hasn't been where South Carolina has been. Even though they're seniors, I have to think they're going to have nerves, just like Flage may have nerves. Whereas when you're playing on the court where South Carolina's got 18,000 people, you're comfortable. So I hope that if Flage has that moment again tomorrow, that maybe Virginia Tech We'll have those moments, too, and it won't be such a dominating performance by the opponent like South Carolina was. I mean, from the tip they scored when we played South Carolina. The hat, they gave us these hats, and I was looking for some cowboy boots. Uh, they didn't have that, but, you know, I love country music, 
and I just thought it was appropriate. I was gonna come in here and sing, all my exes live in Texas, which is true. I only have one though. I've only been married once. But then I'm gonna end it with this. There's an old, I'm the happiest girl in the whole USA. Who sang that? Bam! Vopal, tell them, baby. Y'all have a good day. You got one more question, Coach. Oh, one more. Too. That was one more. I promise. This was the last one. <laughs> See? Can't trust the media. They said just two more questions. I said a few more oh, questions. Oh, okay. Got one, well, one, one is last a few. One. All right. <laughs> one more last one. Hey, Kim, it's Nancy Armour with USA Today. I'm sorry, that would have been a perfect ending. But um, you've talked about former players. You've talked about Baylor. So I have to ask, have you been... You don't have to ask. You choose to ask. I do, yes. But there it's you part go. of my job. Okay. Um, have you had any conversations or been in touch with BG since she was no. released? Okay. No. But I'm glad she's back. I'm glad she's safe. She's sound. I think everybody is. And uh, But no, I have not. Thank you, Coach. All right. As a reminder, a recording and written transcript of this press conference will be posted on NCAA Digital Media Hub at www.ncaa.veritone.com.
Momentarily, we'll begin the Division I National Semifinal Game 2 press conference featuring the South Carolina Gamecocks. We'll hear an opening statement from Coach Staley and follow with questions for student athletes Aaliyah Boston and Zaya Cook. The student athletes will then be dismissed and we'll open up questions for Coach Staley. As a reminder, please make sure your cell phones are on silent. We will get started momentarily. When called upon, please state your name and affiliation. There are wireless microphones on each side of the room. Please wait for the microphone to reach you before stating your question. For those joining remotely, please use the raise hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. When you are called on for your question, please unmute your line and state your name and affiliation. Again, we'll begin momentarily.
Good afternoon and welcome to the Division I National Semifinal Game 2 press conference featuring the South Carolina Gamecocks. Again, we will hear an opening statement from Coach Staley and follow with questions for the student athletes, Aaliyah Boston and Zaya Cook. Student athletes will be, then be dismissed and will open up with questions for Coach Staley. Please make sure your cell phones are on silent. When called upon, please state your name and affiliation. There are wireless microphones on each side of the room. Please wait for the microphone to reach you before stating your question. For those joining us remotely, please use the raise hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. When you are called on for your question, please unmute your line and state your name and affiliation. Good afternoon, Coach. If we could begin with having you um, provide an opening statement. Yeah, super, super excited to be here. Congratulations to all the teams um, that are here and um, look forward to tomorrow night. We'll open up with questions for the student athletes. Nancy Armour, USA Today. Um, Aliyah Anzaya, over here. <laughs> um, there's been so much talk and attention about this game, this Iowa-South Carolina matchup. I think people have been anticipating it all year. What is it like to be a part of that, and what does it say about the growth of the women's game that this is probably the most highly anticipated game at either one of the Final Fours? Yeah, um, it's really exciting. Just like you said, everybody has been talking about this matchup for a really long time now, but it's exciting that, you know, it's happening in the Final Four. I think it's just a great game for women's basketball. I know there's going to be a lot of people in the crowd, a lot of people watching the game, and so it's just super excited to be in that environment. Um, I just think that it just shows how much women basketball is evolving um, and, and people actually want to see us play. Um, and, and luckily, it's two good teams um, playing against each other in the Final Four. And like Leah said, I think a lot of people are going to watch it. I think it's going to do big numbers, um, and it's going to be a game that's down in history. We'll take a question to your left. Hi, Leah. Maggie Hendricks from Bally Sports. Um, I know that the WNBA draft is not at the front of your mind, but it is very soon. So I wanted to ask, what do you think you will bring to a team at the next level? Um, oh, that's a great question. I think um, my voice, number one, I think that I'm going to be a great communicator um, to the team. Um, I think my post presence, I'm going to try and just continue to be that dominance post presence no matter who I'm playing against. We have a question in the front row on your right-hand side. David Kloniker, Post and Courier. Zaya, you and Caitlin played together on a Team USA, I believe the under-16 team. Just what do you remember about that matchup and uh, you know, how has she grown and how much are you looking forward to this matchup? Yeah, Caitlin has always been a, a knockdown shooter uh, since I can remember. Um, and she's also a great teammate. Uh, we, I think we played together two years it was two years. All, all three of us played together. Um, but she's definitely a knockdown shooter. Um, but I, her game has grown tremendously in a lot of different ways. Um, and I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Question to your left. Jen Hadfield with the next. Um, for, for both of you, you know, from the outside, it can look almost easy to do what you've done, go undefeated so far, because you guys make it look easy at times. But I'm just curious, what are you know one or two challenges you faced along the way um, to get to this point? Um, I think just bringing it every single day. Uh, that's a that's a huge challenge, and not a lot of people can do it. Um, to be able to come into practice every day and know that you have to set set the tone. Uh, you can't take any shortcuts. You can't take any breaks. Um, and it, it's very hard. A lot of people don't understand how hard it is to be at the top. It's actually harder to be at the top than anywhere else, I believe. Uh, so, like I said, you got to always keep your foot on that gas and you have no time to take breaks off. I also agree with that part, but then also just continuing as upperclassmen, bringing the underclassmen along with us. You know that you want them to know that they can be confident to shoot their shot in the game, just be confident and ready when their name is called. Question for Kareem, you can go ahead. Kareem Copeland, Washington Post. This one's for you, Leah. Um, Dawn has talked a lot about the sacrifices that you made for your, you know, your own individual numbers and things like that. I'm just curious, was there a time where 
maybe that stuff was more important to you and that you've grown and, and how rewarding is it, you know, to make that extra play where you're setting up your teammates um, instead of necessarily, you know, going for yours, quote unquote. Yeah, um, I think I've always been that type of player that wants the betterment um, for the team. And so, just like you said, like my numbers are down, but I mean, I think it's because of what we have going on here. I mean, everyone is stepping up, everyone is hitting shots. Um, I think everything is being carried equally um, and it's really good. I mean, I, if I could do it again, I would. Maria McElwain, Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, so we've seen that more, there's more interest in the women's game through TV viewership. <clears throat> How does it feel to be part of a growing movement and how have you seen that grow over your four years? For both y'all. Okay, um, it feels really nice. Um, you know, you can always think about people making negative comments about women's basketball, women's sports in general, but it's proof that the numbers are going up. Everyone is excited to watch the women's game. Everyone is buying their tickets to travel to watch their favorite players, watch their favorite team. And so you can't really deny that people are interested um, in watching women's sports, and so it's just really excited to be part of the generation that's continuing to help it grow. Great. <laughs> For either one of the players, um, Lauren Moses of Valley Sports, I'm curious on how the alum of South Carolina have really encouraged you guys in your journeys ever since you were freshmen up until now. Um, they've been in the same place. How have you guys um, used that encouragement, and how have you been able to do that for your uh, um, freshmen? I believe you could start first oh, for us. Oh, shoot. Um, you know, a, a lot of the alum, I mean, they come back, they come to practice, um, they even they even reach out um, and they talk to us about things. You know, there have been a couple times where Asia has reached out and, you know, they travel like Thai travels and they just come and they want to support. They want to support us and they just give us tips. You know, they've been where we are um, and so they just want to see us grow. And for us helping the underclassmen as of right now, I mean, they're, they're our sisters, you know, we want to see them shine because we understand at some point we're not going to be on the same team with them and they're going to be the new leaders of the program and so we want them to just continue the um, tradition that we have. Um, I agree. I think the alums have definitely helped me out a lot, especially all of the guards. Um, with Ty being here with us, she, she's she been giving me tips uh, just to be on, be on a big stage again. Um, and like I said, I, I want to do the same thing for the younger ones. Um, I always looked up to Ty. And I think I've done a pretty good job at leading the younger ones in, in the space that I'm in my, right now. Um, so it's just a blessing to be here. Uh, for Aaliyah and then Zaya Piganity from WSPA TV, they've got obviously a great player guard who scores 27 a game. They've got a post player who scores, I think, 17 a game. So when have you encountered maybe an outside inside threat like that this season? And talk about kind of scouting it and defending it and you know, how you can take care of one and the other at the same time? Um, I think our whole league has prepared us. There have been teams that we play with a great post player and great guards um, that just do a great job passing the ball. And so I think we've been, we've been prepared for that, um, just understanding how we're going to do that. And, you know, I mean, we're scouting them, understanding what they do well, just understanding that we're going to have to compete, be ready for 40 minutes, um, and just pressure them. Um, I agree, but I also think uh, – we just can't focus on them. They have a, a whole starting five that we have to worry about. I think if we just get too focused on the main player, then we'll let others get off. Uh, so Coach definitely emphasized on that to make sure that we're playing everyone. And everyone that's on the floor is, is doing their defensive job uh, to stop the team from doing what they usually do. Uh, Alan Cole, GamecockScoop.com. For either of you, you had a chance to get here that first year, and obviously the pandemic cut that short. How much did that motivate you, and kind of what was that time like during the pandemic, and I guess how much did it motivate you to maybe get back here once you did get a chance to play in tournaments three straight years? Yeah, um, the pandemic was definitely something that really hit hard, especially because we were doing so well um, in the season. But I think it motivated us because, you know, we could never get that year back, but we did want to experience that March Madness, that Final Four, that national championship. And so, I mean, since that has happened, it's just something that we just continue to work on because we know that that is a year that we can never get back to experience this. Uh, this is for both of you guys. Um, obviously, you've been on this stage before here at the Final Four, but this is your guys' send-off uh, Final Four. Mm -hmm. Is there any different feelings about this one, and is there any pressure to go out on top? Um, I think pressure can either make you or break you, so I just want to use the pressure that I have 
in, in the best way possible to make me go out there and play very hard. Um, but it definitely is an emotional moment just to know that this will be our last time all together, playing together. Um, but we try to keep our emotions to the side and just focus on business right now. Alexis right. Davis, Rising Media Stars, question for Aaliyah <laughs> and Zaya. Being that your coach, Don Staley, has played at the highest level WNBA, gold medals, everything, the whole nine, what has she taught you about how to handle the spotlight and making sure that you don't let it overwhelm you and you're focused on game time play? Yeah, um, you know, coach is a legend. That's just what she is. And so for us to be coached by her, it's just something truly special. But just like you said, she's she's taught us how not to – get too high just like you said and too low because staying balanced is the most important thing being able to car part mentalize um different aspects of what's happening but be focused and ready to go when it's time to step on the floor i think something coach always had to tell me is don't get too high with the highs or low with the lows <laughs> she just says maintain uh so that's what i try to do the best i can um it took me a while to get here but um i, I finally can maintain <laughs> To your right. Emily Adams with the Greenville News. Um, you guys, this program won its first national championship in this arena when you guys were being recruited. Do you guys remember watching that game at all and kind of how much of an influence did seeing them win that title have on your decision to come to South Carolina? Yeah, um, I, definitely, <clears throat> I definitely remember watching that game. I'm pretty excited. Um, thinking about my, my decision and that game specifically, I think just overall what South Carolina is about, you know, them winning a national title was pretty cool because I knew that I wanted to also do that and play under Coach Staley. Um, I think when after I watched that game, I told my dad, like, I want to go there. I want to go there. <laughs> so, uh, but of course, I had to weigh out my options. But uh, when I saw them win a national championship and just seeing the type of person Coach was and the players that she were, was recruiting, um, it definitely made me want to come here. To your left. Uh, Jeff Linder, Cedar Rapids Gazette, uh, either of the players. How much of a challenge is Iowa's pace and the speed that they play with? Um, I mean, I think we also like to push pace. We like to get up and down the floor. So I think it's gonna, it could be a fast-paced game. I don't think we're going to look at it as a challenge because they like to get up and down the floor because we enjoy doing that as well. And our final question to the back and the right for the student athletes. Uh, for Ali and Zai, Chaz Frazier, ABC Columbia. Uh, sticking with the theme of the alumni, that 2017 team, have any of the people or the players reached out to you and gave you any advice since they played at this site and won the first national championship here? You know, just telling us to just compete. That's really what it is. Um, be ready because we're built for the moment. Same. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. you. At this time, we'll open up for questions for Coach Daly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Amanda, we'll start with you from front office. Hi, Amanda from front office sports. Um, I'm over here. Hello. <laughs> um, so you've talked a lot about, as far as investment in the women's game, um, women's the women's tournament getting units, maybe breaking off. Um, the media rights package. Um, let's say the NCAA does get more money to invest. In addition to units, what would you like to see them invest in to improve the women's Final Four even more? Um, you said aside from the, the units? Um, <clears throat> um, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. I, I thought that being a part of two regional sites and and how well that that went off i mean i think I think the the structure was there because that's what the men do um so that was pretty cool um, The units are pretty big like that's pretty big because that's the thing that's been weighing us down, meaning it it cost a lot to bring all of these teams all around the country in the tournament. Um, and, you know, if we can, if we can, if we can, if we can bring millions into our athletics departments, um, I think it would help, it would help on our campuses. So it's a long-term effect uh, where, you know, if you're, if you're a football player, your, your experience is probably a lot different than a women's basketball player. I mean, we can all agree to that um, because they're bringing in the money, right? And then if, if we're bringing in the money, 
our experience will be a little bit different. And then there are, there are things that coaches won't have to fight for. They just happen because you're bringing in some money. It's not, it's, you're not seeing the red all, always. So that's what that would mean. So it just will elevate the whole um, student athlete experience from a women's basketball perspective. We're gonna to stay to your right, coach. Don Nancy Armour with USA Today Sports. Two completely unrelated questions. What makes Aaliyah such a great player? And then the second question is, you have been very visible in terms of using your platform. When and, and why did you decide that was so important? And what kind of message do you think you're giving to your players by being as vocal as you are? Um, I, mean, I mean, Aaliyah is an extraordinary person. So it starts there, like, you know, she's rooted in, in her faith. She has an incredibly um, beautiful family that they get it. <laughs> they, they get it. Um, they don't really take themselves too seriously. Um, they've, you know, they got a, they got a praying mother. Um, and they, she's got a great support system. So Ali is allowed to be who she is. Uh, find, she's found herself at a young age because of um, the foundation that her parents built for her. Um, and then, you know, I, as far as using my voice, um, I think I've been asked a lot more questions because of our success. I mean, if you ask me um, something that, that people ask me nowadays, 12 years ago, I, I would probably give you, the, I would give you my heart, what was on my heart. Um, I think the platform has gotten bigger because of our success, and I, I'm asked a lot more questions. So I give people what, I try to give people what they ask me from my own experience. It may not be for everyone, but it's from my own experience from being around the game. Coach, we're gonna take two questions from your left. Hi, Don. Maggie Hendricks with Bally Sports. You have this outstanding group of seniors who plenty of them will be going to the WNBA. What are they going to be bringing to the teams that get them? Um, I mean, our players are prepared. Um, they're, they're prepared for the rigors of um, the challenges of what the, the WNBA is all about, um, whether that's – I mean, I think the, the biggest thing is they're mentally prepared for whatever – um, a, a team needs, whether that's coming off the bench, um, whether that's being thrown into being a starter, um, whether that's uh, being able to communicate and pick up things fairly quickly, because the league moves very quickly. So the pace of the, pace of the league, I don't think they'll have an issue um, picking up. And if you can pick things up, then you increase your chances of, of, of making a team and, and making an impact. Uh, Andrea Adelson with ESPN.com. Uh, first, Don, what do you see in the matchup with Kait Caitlin Clark? And along those lines, have you sensed any extra motivation or juice from your players? Because she's already won a couple of Player of the Year awards, and I'm sure they believe that the Player of the Year is on your team. Um, I mean, the, the juice is in the winning the national championship. Like, I, I don't, our, our players don't really care about anything else besides that. Um, so I think we are, again, we, we are, we're strong in our beliefs and, and what we do and, and how we've done things. And at this point, we just want to win. And that's their approach. And I, I, I love them for that. Like they, they're, they're not letting any, any one thing or any one person um, distract them from the goal at hand. You're back right, coach. Hey, Coach. Pete Hannity from WSPA-TV. When you won the first title, that was built with a lot of players from South Carolina, maybe more regionally. Obviously, this group comes from all corners of the globe. Talk about branching out. Was it just simply the success that got you on the radar, as maybe Zaya and Aaliyah alluded to? And, and just what an interesting collection of kids from South America, Canada, and, and various you know, U.S. states and territories. Um. <clears throat> I think what's attractive about our program um, is I think we're just Sorry. authentic. Sorry. Whether you like us or not, you, you can respect where we're coming from. Like, I, I know um, the, the parents, the, 
the parents of the players or prospects that that I that I recruit that we recruit um, they they know that what we're telling them holds true um, from us telling them and then when they come on the campus they hear it from other players they meet other parents and um, <clears throat> it's, it's something that you you have to want for for yourself and for your daughter because it's not easy like coming to South Carolina is not it's not an easy thing um, it becomes e easier when you're when you're able to grasp what we're what we want like we want them to be successful individually and collectively how you get there it's hard and it's uncomfortable but once you're there you have a pretty good understanding of of how it works and how to be successful excuse me <coughs> to your back and your left hand side <coughs> Hi, Coach. Jen Hadfield with the next. Um, just curious, what have you learned from any of your previous Final Four runs at South Carolina that you can apply this year, either as you prepare individually or as you prepare your team? Um, I mean, I can remember there's just really a lot of stuff that you have to do. So if you don't know, if you don't know that and you're experiencing it for the first time, um, it's hard because you don't feel like you get enough time to prep. And it's the biggest stage of, of college women's basketball. Thank you. Um, so that's what, it, that's what it is. I just prepare for um, long days um, and less, less prep time. Um, but, I, you know, once you're here, you're not going to do – you're not going to create any magic. <laughs> you're not going to create any magic. And I do think rest is equally as important as – getting out on the floor and, 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 and working out. Um, so just the experience of getting back here and knowing and, and where, to, where to focus, you know, so. Coach. <clears throat> hey, Coach, Doug Feinberg, DAP. Um, ticket prices for the women, there's more than the men on average. There's an undefeated team with you guys. There's Caitlin Clark, there's Leah Boston. It seems there's a lot more interest in storylines on the women's Final Four and the men's Final Four. You've been around this game for a while. Is that a good thing to see that the growth of this, that there's more interest and attention on the games on Friday than potentially on Saturday and then on Sunday instead of Monday? Yeah, it's great. I mean, it, it, it's, it's been building towards this for a long time. Um, and, and fortunately for us, um, not just South Carolina, just us as women's basketball, I mean, we got a lot of star power behind our, our sport. And it, it, it increases. You, you, you just mentioned two, but you got, you know, you got Angel Reese, you know, you got Amor, you got Kitley, you got, you got all these players who have um, been incredible, um, just incredible, <clears throat> creating incredible stories for, for our game. And I, and I, I do think they, you, you all are, are telling them. And that's always a great thing. Hi, Don. Maria McElwain from the Philadelphia Inquirer. A couple of unrelated questions. Um, first one, kind of bouncing off of that, um, people were saying, oh, Don should go for the Temple men's job, men's <laughs> basketball job. Um, what did you, did you have any thoughts on that? Obviously, you've got a good thing going here in South Carolina. No thoughts. I don't, I don't want to coach in the men's game. Yeah. Right it's cold up there, too. <laughs> hey, uh, Phil Cornblue, Sports Talk Media Network in South Carolina. Back in your playing days, when you were facing a great uh, individual opponent, did you seek out the job of defending that opponent yourself? And inside your locker room right now, is there kind of a, a battle about who's going to defend Caitlin? Um, I mean, uh, I'm did I seek out? I don't. I don't know if I. I think. I think Debbie Ryan just knew. I think she just knew. So it wasn't. It wasn't. I think she played off of my competitiveness, and um, so I. I think I guarded. Maybe Tammy guarded it. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Um, but in our locker room, yes, they're they're super competitive. They, they they all want a chance to guard her, and it's going to take all of them probably, you know, and, and more. To, to guard Caitlin. I mean, she is um, someone that 
that is unpredictable. Like she, she'll be able to pivot and, you know, take and make incredible shots, um, both from outside, way outside the three to at the, at the rim. Um, so we, we got to show her different looks in order for us to, you know, hopefully keep her, keep her somewhat under control. Coach, we're going to go to your right hand side, that third row. Uh, my question for you is, you know, obviously there's a lot more growth in the game, which has been great to see. How do you feel like that's affecting the basketball? Like how, each year is different, right? But can you feel the difference compared to last year, to the extra eyeballs watching on TV, or, you know, making your players a little nervous, even more focusing on that? How do you sort of maintain uh, the same kind of focus and performance that you've been able to uh, as kind of the interest grows? Well, I'll say this. Um, the people in Columbia, South Carolina, our, our fans, our local media, um, they've put us on a big stage for a very long time. Um, so we've created habits um, to, to help us deal with situations like this. Like, I don't think, you know, our players are going to run from the, the spotlight. I think they run towards it um, because they want to win a national championship. So um, we've created habits. Um, in approaches to, to big games like this that will keep our nerves under wraps. And, you know, for me, I follow their lead. <laughs> hey, Don. Um, Lake and Lippman with Fox Sports. All year we've kind of heard this, you know, Caitlin Clark versus Leah Boston debate. How important is a debate like that for the growth of the women's game and then to see it kind of unfold on the Final Four stage? I mean, anytime that you're, you're able to talk about our game and talk about two um, young women who have um, been storylines throughout the, throughout the season, I think it's great. I, I do think some people do cross the line um, at times um, because, um, because they're each of their fan base's favorites. Um, you know, but it's, it's being talked about. I just don't like, I don't like when people cross the line. And because and, our, our game is, I mean, it's pure, it's, you know, it's blossoming. Uh, but I guess, I guess it's part of sports when, when people can take jabs at, at either, you know, at, at either young people. I just hope they're not looking at it and seeing it because um, it's not cool. Coach, to your right in the back. Coach Zach Prolutsky, Fox Carolina. What do you remember about that trip to Dallas in 2017 in the Final Four? And how do you think your program has grown, evolved uh, to be here today, going for back-to-back -back third since then? I mean, I love Dallas. I, do, I love Dallas. Dallas uh, um, is where we got our first, our first um, national championship. I mean, I, I just remember, I just remember, obviously the Dallas police officers the motorcade, they get us where we need to go. Super cool seeing that. And those super cool experience that again. Um, I just remember the shot that, that beat UConn and then having to play, having an all SEC um, national championship game. And then us um, knowing Mississippi State as well as we knew them because we played them two, two three weeks before in the SEC tournament championship. And I just remember it's a, you know, the familiarity of, of our opponent and, and, and knowing that we got a really good shot at winning. And then our players, um, although it was really hard to win, um, they made a mounting comeback, um, but relieved that we actually won the championship. Coach, we're gonna stay back to that back row on the right hand side. Cora Hall for the Greenville News. Don, your players were just talking about the, the alum from that first championship team as well as others they have relationships with. What does it mean to you to see the, your alum continue to pour into the, the current players and also to see the ripple effect that has on them to want to continue that? I mean, it's cool. I mean, every, you know, every, every season is a lot different, you know, but um, every, every player that has played in our program, they, they leave a a legacy of leadership that just continues to trickle down um, to the younger players. Um, and I, I know, you know, the, the, the players that 
the former players that come back, the ones that are in the WNBA, they talk more about the WNBA than they do actually this moment that, that we're in. And I, I, I'm happy that they, they get to, to hear some of the, their experiences. Um, so, I mean, some of them got a, a big decision to make over the next few days. Um, so it, it's cool that we, we got a, a somewhat of a cheat code of having a lot of players in the league to allow them to make an informed decision. Coach Judy Gatson from WISTV, excuse me. <clears throat> Two questions completely unrelated. Number one, so much is being made of the individual awards, but when we look at Greenville and the MVP, and we look even yesterday with the National Defensive Player of the Year, Aaliyah Boston used both occasions to highlight her teammates, LA and Bree Bill. Talk a little bit about how much that attitude, that selflessness, has impacted the personality and character of your team. And also, when it comes to the winning formula for South Carolina, in addition to what we see on the court, the strength and conditioning, the preparation that we don't see off the court, how that has played a factor? Yeah. I mean, uh, Leah Boston, there, 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 will be a, uh, there will not be another Leah Boston. Um, her selflessness, um, her ability to, to, to meet moments on the court and off the court, and, it, and it's authentic, it's organic, it's genuine. Um, she really means um, everything that she says out of her mouth. Like, she really means it. Um, so I'm not surprised that she used, in, in that moment where she's being uh, recognized um, and rewarded for the efforts that, she, that she's given our team over the past four years, to bestow it on someone else on her, on her team is, is Aaliyah Boston-like. Um, and then, I mean, our, our strength and conditioning coach, they call performance coaches now, our, our athletic trainer, um, I mean, they are the ones that, when, when we are our most healthiest, we are our most successful. And a lot has to do with uh, Molly Bonetti, Bonetti and uh, Craig Oates, who, I mean, and they and they get along. Like I do think they, do think they go out drinking too, at, at times. But they have built a relationship to where, you know, they work well together. They they book in our players um, into um, getting their mind, body, and souls in a place where um, they have to get up to practice like we practice every single day. So they have a lot to do with that because we we're as coaches we're not a part of that. You know the performance coach and the and the trainer are joined at the hip to make sure that our players are are in a great position to uh, to to perform every single day. So to be at the final four to 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 prep for um, the semifinals game tomorrow, a lot of credit has to go to them in, in making sure that our players are are ready to rock and roll. We'll take our final question from the back row. <clears throat> Hi, Coach Nui Scruggs, NBC Dallas. Um, we're the same age, so I, I have followed your career from the time you played at, at uh, Virginia. And I've always wanted to ask you, uh, that great team that you were on with Tammy and Heidi, um, not winning at all, has that fueled you in terms of your success? Because you've won everywhere since at all levels as a player and a coach. Um. I mean, it used to fuel me when we hadn't won. <laughs> um, now, um, now is you know I think basketball has a strange way of um, just looking out, like looking out for the people who really do it for the purity of it. Like I just I love basketball. I love what I do, um, and um, and I do think I'm I'm favored in a lot of guys. A favor has has, has shined and bright on my career, um, but no, I'm not I'm not driven by it anymore. Uh, but it was one of my lifelong dreams as a child growing up in in, in North Philly in the projects. I only saw women play um, two times on television. That was the Olympics, and that was the national championship game. And that is the that was the driving force in. And, and, and me wanting to wanting to accomplish that because that at that time that was the biggest and it's, it's probably the biggest still the biggest thing besides um, playing in the league. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Thank you all for covering our game. 
As a reminder, a recording and written transcript of this press conference will be posted in the NCAA Digital Hub at www.ncaa.veritone.com.
The Division I National Semifinal Game 2 press conference featuring the Iowa Hawkeyes will begin momentarily. <clears throat> we'll begin with open, an opening statement from Coach, followed by questions for the student athletes. The student athletes will then be dismissed and will open again for questions for Coach. Please make sure your cell phones are on silent. When called upon, please state your name and affiliation. There are wireless microphones on each side of the room. Please wait for the microphone to reach you before stating your question. For those joining remotely, please use the raise hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. When you are called on for your question, please unmute your line and state your name and affiliation. Again, for those in the room, as you ask questions, please make sure your hand is raised high so that we're able to see you, acknowledge you, and, 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 and have you answer questions.
Welcome. I have it. Welcome to the Division One National Semifinal Game Two press conference featuring the Iowa Hawkeyes. We'll hear an opening statement from Coach and follow with questions for the student athletes. The student athletes will then be dismissed, and we'll hold and ask questions for Coach. Please make sure your cell phones are on silent. When called upon, please state your name and affiliation. Again, there are wireless microphones on each side of the room. Please wait for the microphone to reach you before stating your question. For those joining us remotely, please use the raise hand function to indicate that you would like to ask a question. When you are called on for your question, please unmute your line and state your name and affiliation. Good afternoon. At this time, we'd like to have Coach open up with her opening statement. All right. Um, well, we are extremely excited to represent Hawkeye Nation here at the Women's Final Four. We know we have an incredible challenge ahead of us. Uh, but at the same time, everybody loves an underdog, uh, so hopefully a lot of people will be cheering for us. Um, you know, I've been coming to the Final Four for a long, long time, but my seats are finally going to be pretty good tonight, so I'm excited about that. Um, excited also about Caitlin obviously being named the AP Player of the Year today. Um, one of my assistants, uh, Coach Jan Jensen, will also be getting the Assistant Coach of the Year Award. Um, so a lot of great things happening. Um, I'm just trying to convince my team 40 minutes of basketball and a lifetime of memories, and that's all we have to focus on. We'll open up for questions for the student athletes. We'll start right here on our, our right to our right with Doug. Uh, Doug Feinberg, the AP. Caitlin, I know you're a huge fan of basketball, watching it and obviously playing it. When you see that ticket prices for the women's tournaments more than the men's right now, and that there seems to be a much bigger buzz for this tournament, your guys' game, the other game. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you know that you're part of a movement that seems to finally be blossoming for women's basketball? Yeah, I think it's pretty incredible. Um, you know, I think it's starting to get, you know, the viewership, the attention, things like that, that, you know, it deserves. And when people really turn on the TV or sit in the seat, they understand how good the product is and how much fun it is to watch. And, you know, I've loved the game ever since I was a young girl. So I've always seen, you know, how good it is. And I really think, you know, that we have so many good players in our game right now, whether it's WNBA, whether it's at the college level. Um, and people are really starting to figure that out. So I really think sky's the limit. But, um, you know, I don't know if ticket prices really – are as indicative just because ours is in an actual basketball arena and they're playing in a um, you know football stadium so I don't know really how much that affects it but uh, I still think it shows the demand of you know people want to be here and be in this arena that seats 20,000 people um, so more than anything I'm just lucky and we're just lucky that we get to play on this stage in front of so many people that you know love the game and, and want to watch our game. Nancy. Nancy Armour USA Today Sports uh, two questions first of all for Caitlin following up on that a lot of talk about this game in particular, and you know, there are people who are mad that it's not a championship game, that it's a semifinal game. Um, what does that say about the the women's game and, and the fact that you do have people that are that passionate that they're you know arguing and mad about that? And then for Gabby and Monica, do you have a favorite memory of Caitlin like shooting or or like a, a specific game that she did something very Caitlin like? Yeah, I think it's, you know, really good for our game. Um, you know, I think even, you know, the conversations about player of the year, conversations about coach of the year, conversations about who's playing on the floor, I think that's really good. Um, I think people need to realize, you know, how many tremendous players there are in our game, how many tremendous coaches there are in our game. And I think we're lucky enough, you know, we play in the Big Ten. I believe that's the best conference in America. Um, we're, we've been lucky enough to play against some of the best players, you know, Diamond Miller, Mackenzie Holmes. You can make a long list of really, really talented players that we have played. Um, and we've played against the National Co Coach of the Year, um, um, we'll have some people have said, obviously, Coach Daly won uh, the Naismith one yesterday. And, you know, I saw Coach Morin was named the AP Coach of the Year today. So congratulations to her as well. I thought Indiana had a tremendous year. But um, I think just finding confidence in that. You know, we've gone up against some really tremendous teams. Obviously, we know South Carolina is, you know, taller than anybody we've ever played. Um, they haven't lost a game all season. But, um, you know, we're just going to be us and believe that we can win. And, you know, that's all you can do. And um, we're going to give it everything we have. And we've enjoyed every second in Dallas. And we want to be playing two more basketball games games yeah and I think thinking about like a game where Caitlin does Caitlin it's I feel like weird for us because we see her do it all the time at practice so it's like a treat for when you guys get to see it um, but I think Michigan at Michigan last year just seeing her kind of single-handedly bring us back into that game um, when we were down we didn't win it but we got really close um, with a limited amount of people so I think that's when I was like oh great everybody gets to see what I see every single day so um, yeah I think my favorite is 
at home, I think we were playing Ohio State, but you had like, she had come down and hit like three logo shots in a row. And I remember looking up at, looking over at Sue Beck with like, what is going on? Like this girl's crazy. Like, I think it was Ohio State. I'm not really sure who we were playing, but yeah, that was crazy. But I was not surprised. <laughs> Question to our right. Right here, Kaylin, Matthew Shinney from TSN. Um, you talk about the difference in the sizes between the men's and the women's where, where they'll be staged. Because this feels like a moment, because this is, you know, Aaliyah Boston, the defending champions and their team versus you and, and your team, two projected number one picks in the WNBA draft, is this maybe the perfect stage to maybe show the NCAA that the women's Final Four can be, should be staged in the same kind of event space as the men's? Yeah, lucky I'm not the one that has to make those decisions. Uh, uh, hopefully I'm just the one that gets to play on the Final Four. Um, but yeah, I think there's, you know, very high demand for this basketball game and even Virginia Tech versus LSU. And, um, you know, so a lot of teams that are, you know, new to the Final Four, obviously us and Virginia Tech uh, haven't been here in a while. And um, I think more than anything, you know, we're just really grateful. I don't care. We could be playing in, you know, a high school gym and I would be just as happy to get to play in the Final Four. So, um, you know, I don't really care where it's played. Um, I'm happy we get to play in the Mavs Stadium, I think that's pretty cool. Um, it might almost be better to play in a, in a basketball arena than a football arena, too. Um, just, you know, I don't know. I think maybe it'd be easier to shoot. I don't know. So um, I don't think it really bothers me, but I think it definitely shows how much the game is growing and how high of a demand there is for people to want to get into the door to this game. And, you know, a lot of people are going to turn it on on TV, too, if they couldn't make it down here to Dallas. So I think we're just grateful more than anything. Question to our left. Uh, Gabe Ibrahim, Her Hoop Stats. Uh, this one's for Monica and Caitlin. Uh, you two carry the offensive load for this team, but you know over the last week, I'd say your Gabby and McKenna have been playing some of the best basketball they've played all season. Mm -hmm. How does that open up the floor for you guys when they're hitting all their shots? Oh, it's tremendous. Um, people kind of have to pick their poison. They can really clog the paint. And then we have Gabby, McKenna, Kate, Caitlin. Um, who are really doing their thing out there, or they can choose to kind of respect them and their game and then leave me a little bit more open. So um, just seeing the work that they've put in all throughout our career here. I mean, we've played 90 plus games together, um, seeing them in the gym all the time, seeing those shots go down in a game. It makes me happier to see their shots go in than my own, truly. Um, so it's just, it's so great for our team. It really opens everything up for me individually. Um, but it's just, we're peaking at the right time. Sorry. Hey, Kareem Copeland, Washington Post. This one's for you, Caitlin. Um, you've gotten as much attention as anyone in the country this year, deservedly so. Have you been able to relish it? Do you enjoy it? Has it gotten old or overwhelming? Or how have you kept it from not being too much? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a support system around me that, you know, kind of, you know, keeps me humble, you know, keeps me grounded. You know, I get picked on the most more than anybody on our team. Um, but I'm not really on social media that much, and I think that helps a lot, too. And um, I've just tried to enjoy every single second. This is the most fun time I've had playing basketball this year, and I think that's why the product has been so good for myself and this team is because, you know, I'm just going out there and having fun and enjoying what I do. It's not to win an award. It's not for our team to hoist trophies. I think that has all come because we've played with the same, you know, love of the game that we've had since we were young girls. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to enjoy every single second of it. I've tried to enjoy every single second of it. I think, you know, it's hard for it to set in right now because I'm so focused on continuing to play basketball and continue to win basketball games. But um, I think, you know, after the season's over, I'll be able to reflect and really enjoy, you know, everything this team's been able to do together. And, um, you know, we've had th two really good seniors that are going to be leaving us. So I'm just trying to enjoy every second I get with them because it's been three really special years of us getting to play together as well. Cassandra Negley with Yahoo Sports. For Gabby and Monica, what was the experience like yesterday being there to support Caitlin at the Naismith? But then also you have South Carolina and their team right there supporting their candidate. Yeah, it was really special to get to be there and support her. I mean, there's no one more deserving of that award. I mean, the work she puts in day in and day out, um, it's unreal. And I think the passion and competitiveness and joy she plays with is what really wants, makes people want to watch her. And I think people are seeing that and just seeing what she's doing day in and day out and the performances that she's putting on and the impact she's had on this team. And she kind of put us on the map, you know? So I think there's really no one more deserving of that award. I'm just glad we were all allowed to be there. I mean, whoever else was there, we were just worried about Caitlin. <laughs> so, yeah. Retweet. <laughs> We're going to stay to the, our, our far back. Hi. 
Blake and Littman with Fox Sports. Caitlin, when did you first start shooting Logo 3s? And for Gabby and Monica, when was your, what's your first memory of seeing Caitlin do that? And what's it like to play with someone who can do that? Honestly, I don't know if I really did it in high school too much. I don't know. Coach Bluter watched me a lot in high school, so maybe she can comment too. Um, but obviously, you, I usually played on a smaller court in high school, so I didn't have as much room to work. Um, but I don't know. I think it's kind of come with, you know, harder defenses, you know, spacing them out more, um, getting stronger in the weight room. Um, my shot mechanics don't change when I back up. And, um, you know, that's a shot I go and practice all the time. Like when I'm in the gym working on my game and getting shots up, like I'm shooting shots from back there. It's not like I just get in the game and just start launching and they somehow go in. Um, sometimes it might seem like that. But, um, you know, those are shots I practice and, you know, I shoot them in practice too. So I think, it, you know, all just stems from the confidence of the, of the work I've put in. But honestly, I would say like it's more so so, you know, come with being in college more than anything. Yeah, I feel yeah. like with summer, oh, sorry. in like summer scrimmages, um, you kind of play a little bit freer basketball because nobody's really watching you. You're just you and your team having fun. And I feel like I remember seeing the progression of like slowly she would just keep shooting them from further back and they would keep going in. Um, but yeah, she, I've seen her in the gym. Like I've walked in and she's shooting at the logo. I'm like, oh, she must be having fun. And it's like, no, she's, <laughs> she's like on the gun shooting from there. So... Um, it was really special to see that in practice um, and scrimmaging against her for the first time. I knew she was going to be a very special basketball player. Yeah, she's been doing that since her first college game. So <laughs> We're going to stay to our left. Uh, Jacob Phillips, the Daily Game Cop. Uh, for you, Monica, obviously South Carolina, really physical in the paint. They crash the board, score a lot of points there. Just what can you say about them, and what have you been doing to prepare for this matchup? Yeah, I mean, they have a great inside presence. Um, I feel like they always have. Both of their bigs are so good. The fact that they bring that size and presence off the bench is, is kind of unreal. But I think that um, I'm really lucky to have played in the Big Ten and even for our journey on this, playing Georgia, uh, playing Colorado, who also have very big, strong physical posts. Um, it's kind of prepared me the best way it could for this game. Um, but I truly think at this point in my career, having played for five years, I've played against so many different style of post players, so many different physicality levels that um, I'm really excited for this opportunity. Um, I think it's going to be really fun. I love going against really great centers. I think it makes me better. It makes everybody better. So um, more than anything, I'm just very excited to play the game. Yep. So our front on the right-hand side. Kyle Hughesman, Hawkeye Report. Um, starting with you, Caitlin. Uh, this game's kind of been billed as, you know, you against Dalia a little bit because of the, you know, the player of the year debate. Um, can you just talk about, you know, the role that your teammates around you are going to gonna have tomorrow to try to pull off the upset? And then for Monica and, and Gabby, um, what do you guys kind of have to do to be able to make sure that you are, you know, contributing at your highest level, you know, in the biggest game of the season to make sure that you can help help Caitlin as well? To all, because you guys always talk about, you know, a balance throughout to try to, to this when at your, you're at your best. Yeah, um, it's going to be Iowa versus South Carolina, and that's who's going to win the game. It's not going to be one player that's going to win the game. And, um, you know, I'm lucky enough to have four really good teammates on the court with me at the same time. And, you know, I love playing a team sport. I don't think I would like to play an individual sport. And, you know, if the game's not going your way, you're lucky enough to have teammates that you can always rely on and lean back on. And I think we're lucky enough that we've built a culture and a program where we always have each other's backs. And, you know, I feel like Gabby and McKenna, Kate, are shooting the basketball really, really well right now. So I feel like that could also pose some problems and um, you know they're going to be all up on us playing really good defense you know that's kind of what they hang their hat on and, and they're really good at it so um, you know I think it's you know just relying on one another there's going to be ups and downs in the game that's how basketball is played and um, you know we have five really good people that are going to be on the floor at the same time so um, we're going to need to use one another and everybody's going to have to contribute. Yeah I would just say going in there knowing it's going to be a battle it's going to be physical just being able to value the ball, and then obviously we're going to have to knock down some outside shots to uh, take some pressure off Caitlin and just make them spread out, you know. And I think one thing for me, like that never wavers in the game, is my defense. If I, it's one thing I can always control my energy and my effort on defense. So I think that's going to be huge in this uh, upcoming game. Yeah, and we've gotten this far by just being ourselves, stepping into our roles, um, and just doing what we know how to do. So we don't have to change that for this game. We have the number one offense, so just kind of ride with that, um, keep that going, but. We, are, we got where we are being who we are, so we just need to keep doing that. Question to our left. 
Nancy Armour, USA Today Sports again. Uh, for Monica and Gabby, would you agree that Caitlin is the most picked on player on your team? And if so, why? <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> she's just, it's just so easy to. I mean, she's just so loud. And like, when she comes at you, you want to go right back, you know? <laughs> but she's just like goofy, silly. So it's just easy. She takes jokes very well. Yeah. So. She's the big, one of the biggest personalities on our yeah. team. So it's so easy to kind of fire them right back at her. She, she gives it back too. Don't, yeah. don't get that twisted. <laughs> We're staying to our left. Lauren of Valley Sports. Um, I'm curious, just as the game has grown, who you guys um, looked at, looked up to, who were in the same seats that you guys are sitting in today, and how they had kind of helped you think about the game differently, how you want to be a part of the change um, moving forward. I was just actually looking at my Snapchat memories, and I was at the games where Arike hit the two buzzer beaters, and Kobe was in the gym and everything, and I was with my AU team, and I was just like thinking about how I was always like, wow, I want to be them one day. Like, and now I'm here, and it's just so special. Like, it still gives me the chills just to think about how I, that was my dream, you know. And now people are looking up to us, and they want to be us. And I, I just think it's such a special moment. It's bigger than the game at that point, you know. So I think just soaking it all in and just knowing that people are looking up to us, and we were once looking up to those girls, and I think it's just awesome to think about. Yeah, I loved Maya Moore. She was always my favorite player growing up uh, when she was at UConn and even when she was with the Lynx. And obviously, you know, that's the closest WNBA team to the state of Iowa. So that's always who I rooted for. And that's the first ever WNBA game I went to. Um, my dad took me and they would play the Seattle Storm. So I got to see Sue Bird, too, which was pretty cool. So that's who I'm going with. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can think of a specific player. I watched a lot of Lynx growing up, being from Minnesota, too. Like, Lindsey Whalen was a god in Minnesota, truly. But I just remember kind of idolizing every single person and just seeing them and thinking how cool their lives were and how fun they were to watch and stuff. And to be up here as one of those people, it's a really full circle moment. We'll take our final question for the student athletes up front. Susan Harmon, hawkfanatic.com. Um, actually, the, my question has a lot to do with what you were just talking about. I, I wondered how you envisioned the appearing at the final four and then what what it's really been like for you yeah i mean it's been a dream come true truly um being able to go to all these events um that we've been able to i mean just being with my team for extra basketball too getting the opportunity to hang out with them in dallas um getting the opportunity to play another basketball game with them it's really surreal it feels like the season but even best case scenario is ending really soon and it doesn't feel quite quite real so I mean just the opportunity to be here with my team that's that's all I could have asked for yeah I agree I mean I this is you know everything you kind of dream of since you were a little kid and my mom texted me last night she was like I feel like I'm kind of stuck in your dream that you were telling that you wanted to do when you were seven years old um, so it's pretty special and I'm just trying to enjoy every single second of it and um, you know we've been lucky enough to you know be together for three years and to go out kind of in this way and accomplish what we wanted to accomplish is pretty special and um, you know we believe while we're here we can win two more basketball games and that is certainly our goal and um, like Mon said we just don't want to like have to not come to practice the next day I don't think a lot of people would probably say that but like we really enjoy you know being with each other and I think that's carried us a long way I feel the same as both of them. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Thank you. At this time, we'll open up for questions from Coach. We'll start with Doug. Hey, Coach. Doug Farmer, DAP. Um, Two part question. The first one is I know you said you got a text from Vivian right after you guys advanced. Had, had you talked to her since then? And has it also sunk in that I was here for the first time in 30 years and you obviously know all the history of the program uh, from your time there and before that, what it means to have Iowa back on this national stage? Well, Doug, it wasn't a text, it was a voice message, which tells you the age of both of us. Um, who leaves voice messages anymore? Um, but I love voice messages because you can hear the enthusiasm in their voice versus reading it on a text. And she definitely had a lot of enthusiasm. You know, her love for the Hawks is strong. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful you were talking about mentors and, you know, for the players. Well, C. Vivian was certainly one of mine. Uh, so I'm very, you know, thankful to have her support um, you know, as the last person that took this team to a Final Four, um, and it, that that really means a lot. Um, you know, to take our team back here, um, 
you know, it, it, sometimes as a coach, when you're for, at some place for so long, it, it does hear it get a little old and you think, well, it's been since 93 since they've been in the Final Four. So, yes, it feels good to be able to be back here again, absolutely. Um, but it's always the people that you're around. And to me, this group of women are special. And um, that's, that's what makes the year special to me. Uh, uh, Maggie Hendricks with Valley Sports. You just had a couple players say that they are really glad they get to go to the Final Four because they get to continue to go to practice, <laughs> which to me is amazing. So what does that say about the environment that you've created here? You know, we love being around each other. We really do. Um, you know, we, we kind of joked about that, that, you know, we came straight from Seattle. We didn't go home. And so we've been on the road together for two weeks right now. And we've enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, if you didn't like the people you were around, this would be a chore. It would not be much fun. But when you trust the people that you're around, when you have respect for them, um, when you know they're doing their job, it, it just, it, it's, it's such a comforting feeling and you don't want it to end. Uh, this has been a fun season for us. And, and so, yeah, we do not want it to end. We're gonna to stay to our left. Nancy Armour, USA Today. Uh, Lisa down here. Um, Coaches tend to be, I'll put this nicely, control freaks, um, whereas Caitlin seems to, like she needs a lot of freedom. And I'm wondering when you realize that and what that has been like. Like the first time that she pulled up and, you know, whether it was in practice or a game and, and took a logo shot, like what, what was your response and, and how has that process kind of worked itself out? Yeah, my, I mean, her freshman year, I definitely had some times I was pulling my hair out. There's no doubt about it. Um, just she had to learn how to play with other players that were good players. You know, in high school, she had to do it all over, you know, all on her own. And, you know, I remember going to her high school games, as she said, and kids yelling overrated to her from the stands. And I just would love to see them today. Um, but, you know, honestly, she, um, she did test us her freshman year. And so we had to learn. It was give and take. It wasn't all like us controlling what she did because I think when you try to stifle somebody, stifle somebody like that, you're ruining a little bit of the type of player they are. I mean, what she does on her own is special. And I, and I think if you were trying to tell her exactly, you know, what a good shot is, because what a good shot for her is totally different than what a good shot for somebody else is. And so she has a little separate set of rules, quite honestly, uh, than other people because she can do things other people can't do. Um, but yeah, we had to get her to understand how to play within a system a little bit without putting out the fire of being Caitlin Clark. We're staying to our left. Uh, Gabe, you her hoop stats. Congrats on being here, coach. Um, I have a question about scouting and game planning. What's your preference in terms of, do you like watching the most recent games of a team? Do you like watching them against teams that you think are similar to you? Do you like watching common opponents? And then how do you get that information to your players uh, in a way that they can use it on the court? All of the above, honestly. We watch recent games. We watch people that are play a little bit more like us. Um, and uh, well, we have a common opponent in Maryland. Um, and so we also have common opponents in Georgia. But Georgia plays so differently than us that that wasn't a game that we were really going to focus on. Um, you know, we've been watching film with our players now for a couple of days and trying to get them as good a feel. Because for right now, I think it's like less practice and more mental, um, more um, film. You're not going to get better at boxing out right now. You know, I'm not going to go in the gym and teach them a skill like that. Um, what we need to do is um, be as familiar as we can with our opponent. And that's what makes it hard in the NCAA tournament because you don't know your opponent as well. When you're going through the Big Ten, you've seen them year after year, same coach, same coaching styles, you know, same players. You know those players so well. In the NCAA tournament, you may only have a couple days to get ready for an opponent, which makes it a lot more difficult. Um, so a lot of film right now that we push to their iPads and they watch on their own and we watch together as well. Coach, we're staying on our left-hand side of the back row. Hi, Lisa. Uh, Lakin Lippman with Fox Sports. I believe after the Elite Eight, you said that Caitlin plays better against better opponents. So I'm curious what you're expecting <laughs> from her tomorrow. You know, um, I honestly just want to take the pressure off of Caitlin. I mean, she just came in here and received all these awards this week. 
She knows a lot of eyes are going to be upon her, and I want everybody else to step up and help carry that weight for her because uh, that's a lot. That's a lot for a 20-year-old. And so, you know, I'm just going to try to take the focus off of her as much as I can and put it on the rest of my team because they want to kind of help shoulder that. Coach, on our right-hand side, the back row. Russ Steinberg from Boardroom. Uh, just wondering how the strength of the Big Ten this year compares to other years in the time that you've been at Iowa and how the conference's overall strength helped prepare you and your team for the tournament. Yeah, there's no, there's no um, doubt that this was the best year for Big Ten women's basketball in a long, long time. I and mean, we had three uh, out of the eight in the Elite Eight, that's like almost 40%, you know, from the Big Ten Conference. And we have felt all year long that playing in the Big Ten prepared us. Now, again, we haven't played South Carolina yet, but has prepared us on this journey so far. Um, and whatever team that we've played, you know, they tried something different. Well, one of the great coaches that we have in the Big Ten has probably tried it against us already. Uh, some of the unbelievable athletes that we have in the Big Ten have probably done that already to us. So. I just think playing in such a strong conference as the Big Ten has helped prepare us for this NCAA journey uh, because we've seen it all. Coach, to your right-hand side of that front row. Kyle Huseman, Hawkeye Report. Kind of a two-part question I asked Caitlin. Um, this game's kind of been built up as kind of a Caitlin Clark versus Aaliyah Boston just because of the National Player of the Year uh, discussions. Um, does that feel like kind of a, a slight to both teams just because both teams do have good players around? Uh, them and then second part uh, what do the players around Caitlin on your team have to do uh, tomorrow to make sure that you guys you know have a chance to win yeah you know I mean people compare um, Caitlin to Lee and to me that's apples to oranges it makes no sense they are completely different players they're completely different uh, positions um, they're both great at what they do but what they do is different uh, and so I don't think you can compare the two of them um, they both are you know, contribute so much to their team's success. But, um, you know, to me, it's not Caitlin versus Aaliyah. You know, it's Iowa versus South Carolina. And we have to, you know, continue to remember that. What we need to do to be successful is we have to make sure we box out. We have to make sure that other people are hitting threes and not just Caitlin. Coach, we're staying to your right-hand side, that second row. Amanda Kristovich from Front Office Sports. Uh, the women's tournament has grown so much in the past few years, but what would you like to see the NCAA continue to invest in at uh, the Final Four specifically so that it grows even more? Well, the growth this year has been amazing. I I'm sure that if they would have had a crystal ball a long time ago, they would have not signed this contract you know, that we're dealing with today in being undersold. For, for our product. Um, you know, they grouped us with a bunch of other sports, which um, at the time maybe seemed like a good idea, but with the growth that we've had over the last 10 years, you know, we have shortchanged ourselves. Um, and, and so I'd like to see that. Um, obviously that change coming with the TV contracts. I'd like to see also, you know, teams being paid for their success in the NCAA tournament like we have on the men's side. You know, athletic directors are going to invest where they get a, um, something back from it. Um, I think at Iowa, with our fan base, we've gotten something back from women's basketball. Certainly, um, notoriety, as well as fans in the stands being the second best populated, um, best uh, fan base that we have in the country. Um, but if, a, you know, if ADs knew, hey, if my women's team makes the NCAA tournament and I get a little money from that, you know, I think that would help some of them invest if they're not completely vested in women's basketball right now. Coach, we're going to shift to our final two questions on your left-hand side. Go ahead. Hey, Coach. Jacob Phillips from the Daily Gamecock. Obviously, when you're playing a team like South Carolina, who's as deep as they are and who can rely on their bench like they can, how does that change your preparation? You know, it really um, doesn't change our preparation just because we're not suddenly going to be able to make our team deeper or do things differently. I mean, at this time of year, I think – if you start changing things, if you start, you know, you have to tweak things, but if you start making, you know, wholesale changes, you're setting yourself up for failure because that's just, you know, abnormal behavior. And, and the team is going to recognize that in you and think, uh oh, something's wrong. If she needs to change all this right now, something's wrong. 
you know, but you're right. The depth on their team is amazing. Their height on their team is amazing. And obviously they have got tremendous coaches, including a former Iowa Hawkeye, I have to say, Jolette Law, wearing the black and gold. I had to tease her last night to see if she had her black and gold shorts underneath that Gamecock stuff. Nancy Armour, USA Today. Lisa, this is a follow-up uh, to the question about the growth of the tournament. Um, we're also seeing women athletes be more present socially. Like, um, I mean, Dawn doing Affleck commercials with Coach mm -hmm. K. Uh, we're seeing some women's basketball players doing commercials for Gatorade and, and other companies. What has it been like to watch that progression? And what does that – what kind of message, message should that send to whether it's the NCAA, athletic directors – even young girls who are, you know, trying to decide if they want to play sports or want to stay in sports. I mean, you have to be naive right now as an athletic director to not see the growth in women's basketball and the impact that it's having with businesses and with fan base and with, you know, corporate sponsorships and such. I mean, I'm going for a walk around the arena a couple of days ago and all of a sudden Dawn's flashing above me, looking down on me, you know, with the Aflac commercial. So it's... um. It's so good, you know, and these, and these players now with NIL, they understand branding. Uh, they understand that they have to create a brand for themselves and that they can be very, you know, have their own businesses and become very profitable from that. Why should that not happen? I think it's a great lesson for them. What, what college student couldn't learn a lot from that type of a lesson of being able to market themselves? And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, Nancy, but I just, You'd have to be really living in a, you know, in a dark hole to not realize what's going on with women's basketball right now. Thank you so much, Coach, and good luck tomorrow. Thank you. As a reminder, a recording of this press conference as well as the written transcript will be available in the NCAA Digital Media Hub at www.ncaa.veritone.com.